The three friends pitched their tent in Eddie's backyard as the cool evening air began to get cooler by the minute. Eddie, Brooks, and Austin were lifelong friends, thanks to their mothers also being friends from high school. Depending on which mother you asked, their births were either planned so that they could be friends or that it just happened to be a freak accident. Brooks's $400 tent was just your average overpriced sporting equipment, but it was what was set up on the inside that made it significantly better. Eddie and his dad were able to run out an extension cord to the tent, and against his mother's knowledge, had set up a small TV with various videotapes that she would certainly not allow. Amongst the tapes were several PG-13 movies, but Eddie was able to snatch a couple of rated R movies from his dad's collection by switching the tape covers to avoid suspicion. One of the tapes was unrated and had a weird writing on it that indicated to Eddie that the probability of this film containing nudity was pretty high. The three boys continued to struggle to navigate the instructions of the newly purchased tent. The sun was on the horizon, but Eddie's mother was kind enough to leave the backyard porch light on to help them see. The backyard was any kid's dream. It had a trampoline, a small zip line, and a fire pit that no one was allowed to touch unless a parent was present. The backyard was neatly cut and very well decorated with various types of flowers and trees. Despite the yard nestling up to the endless woods behind the house, the yard had a tall wooden fence to keep out deer and other animals from getting into the flowers. The fence was taller than most people and provided a perfect barrier from the dark forest, which gave the boys a false sense of bravery and safety. All of the boys would be able to brag about how they all slept outside without their parents, although in a nearly perfectly controlled environment. The fall leaves fell silently as the sun continued to set. Eventually, the 12-year-old boys were able to figure out the complexities of following basic instructions and were able to erect the glorious tent without the aid of a parent. That alone gave them a sense of pride. The backyard was partially illuminated by the porch light, but the visibility had greatly decreased. Eddie's mother popped her head out of the home and gladly announced bagel bites had finished cooking and were now cooling to an edible temperature. The three boys gleefully exited in their tents as their mouths could already taste the delicious treats. Once inside, like most people, they waited as long as you would suspect preteen boys to wait for something delicious to cool down, and naturally scorched their mouths with their first bite. They all shared a laugh and waited again for the bagel bites to cool down, properly this time. After dinner, the boys were too caffeinated, and the mom forced them outside due to rowdiness. Okay, boys, have fun with your little camp out. Come inside if you guys need anything throughout the night. The boys all agreed and went outside to continue the party. The sun had completely set now, giving the boys a much darker environment to camp in. A campfire in the fire pit without an adult was out of the question, so the boys decided to begin their horror movie marathon. The tent was a good distance away from the house, but for safe measure, Eddie popped in a PG-13 movie on the off chance that his mother came out and caught them watching a rated R movie. The first film began and the boys got cozy in their sleeping bags and prepared themselves to be scared senseless. The first movie ended and the boys were excited for another. Eddie popped his head out of the tent to see that the house was no longer illuminated and that the back porch light was off. The darkness unsettled him a bit, but let him know that the parents were probably asleep. Eddie popped in Friday the 13th, and shortly the boys were paralyzed with fear. Woodland sounds from beyond the fence made the boys pause the movie a couple of times. They barely made it through the movie, and it was now close to midnight. Do you guys want to watch one more, or are you too tired? Brooks asked with a whisper. Eddie popped his head out again, and the house was still dark. I got one for you guys. It's from my dad's collection, Eddie said with a wide smile. I don't know the name of the tape, but it's unrated, so you know it must be good. Brooks and Austin were petrified with this news. You know it's going to get kind of late. I should probably go to bed, Austin said, trying to cover up his fear. 
Brooks and Eddie shared a glance, both wanting to do the same, but not wanting to come off as a scaredy cat to one another. Bro, this will be the only time we get to watch this. Don't fall asleep first, man. The boys egged on. Nah, I think I'm good. Just tell me about it tomorrow, Austin insisted. The two boys put on the video, and Austin laid his head down to sleep. The screen turned black as the two boys watched as the first image appeared on the screen. Austin woke up 30 minutes later, to the two boys screaming and turning off the TV. Apparently, the mystery film was too much for the young boys, and they both couldn't stop shaking. What's going on? Austin asked as he rubbed his eyes. Eddie and Brooks were both speechless. Their eyes were wide and they shook silently, both in their own sleeping bags. Before the two could answer, a sound could be heard 50 feet or so behind the tent, near the fence. The sound of someone or something screaming rang out and caused all the boys to stop talking. Austin turned off the only flashlight that was lit in the tent, and everyone remained silent. The boys held their breath when the sound of scratching could be heard on the fence, and something heavy landing in the yard. Something's in the yard, Brooks whispered. Austin grabbed his slingshot from under his pillow, and grabbed some ball bearings from his backpack, and put them in his pocket. We need to make a break for the house, Austin said as his hands trembled. Before anyone could respond, the sound of labored breathing could be heard outside the tent. A stench of decay and disease filled the tent as the creature made its way around the backyard. The boys knew what they needed to do, but they were too afraid to move. Brooks slowly went to grab the zipper of the tent, when the motion detector light illuminated the backyard, indicating something was moving in the yard. The silhouette of a tall and skinny figure could be seen just outside of the tent, but the light distracted it, causing it to move towards the porch. Eddie began to cry as the boys were experiencing something that they were clearly unfamiliar with. Austin silently unzipped the tent and slowly opened it to see what looked like a naked man standing on the porch, looking into the house. The man was dirty and covered with scabs. Flesh was falling off his body and his skin looked gray and sickly. The boys watched in horror as the thing continued peering inside it eventually made its way off the porch and around the house. This is our chance. We need to get inside, Austin whispered. Brooks got out of his sleeping bag and got his shoes on, but Eddie stayed motionless and continued to cry. Dude, we need to get out of here. We can't let this guy find us, Brooks said. It was clear that the two boys needed to get help before Eddie was going to move. We'll have to come back for him whispered Austin. The two boys silently exited the tent, and Austin loaded a ball into the slingshot in the off chance that that thing came back around. The boys stepped out into the cold night air and began to tiptoe their way over to the lit porch when the porch light shut off, leaving the two in the middle of the yard in complete darkness. Oh no, Austin whispered. The two then sprinted as fast as they could in the direction they last saw the house, hoping to get close enough to trigger the porch light. As they sprinted, Austin tripped on the extension cord and fell down, knocking the wind out of him. Brooks continued to the porch and got close enough to trigger the light. By that time, the creature had came back around the house on all fours and spotted Brooks almost on the porch. The creature and Brooks sprinted as fast as they could, but... The creature got to him before he could get inside. While this was happening, a light from inside the house turned on, and commotion could be heard as Eddie's dad made his way around the house. The creature that was on Brooks was now better visible, and clearly not human. The creature had no ears or nose, and its mouth was filled with long, sharp teeth. It pressed its huge hand into Brooks' head into the ground, and it bit with its gnarly teeth into the back of his neck causing him to shriek with pain, and then suddenly, Brooks went limp as the creature broke his neck swiftly. Austin tried his best to breathe, but all he could do was whimper. Eddie's dad then came outside and saw the horror that laid in his yard 
and screamed. The creature then adverted his attention to Eddie's dad and made its way to attack him. He quickly went inside and locked the back door and went to go find a weapon to fight this thing. Austin eventually got his breath back, but laid motionless on the ground as the creature hadn't noticed him yet. The creature clawed at the back door, smearing the blood of Brooks all over it as a result. Eddie saw that his dad went inside and he began to scream for him. The creature then turned and locked eyes on the tent and sprinted towards it. Eddie's dad was able to find a shotgun and came back outside to find the creature had cornered Eddie in the tent. Austin got up and ran inside the home and found Eddie's mother on the phone with the police. Several shots were heard and screams from both the creature and Eddie filled the cold night air. What's going on out there? The mother screamed. Someone's in the backyard, Austin responded as he continued to watch the events unfold. Eddie's dad was able to shoot the creature several times but was unable to kill it. The creature then jumped on Eddie's dad and began to slash his abdomen, spilling out blood and guts all over the ground. Not knowing what to do and wanting to help, Austin stepped out into the porch and aimed his slingshot and fired. Austin knew that at this distance, killing it or even hurting it would not be possible, especially with his slingshot, but that wasn't his intention. All Austin needed to do was distract the creature so it wouldn't kill Eddie's dad. The ball bearing flew through the air, and sure enough, it hit its target, square in the chest. A howl of pain erupted as the creature then set its sights on Austin. Austin reached into his pocket and pulled out another ball bearing and fired again, this time missing the creature. The creature stopped its attack and began barreling its way towards the porch when Austin pulled out his last ball bearing. He aimed it as best as he could, and instead of firing right away and running inside, he waited. He had to make this last one count, or Eddie's dad was for sure a goner. The creature closed the distance with remarkable speed, and Austin released the sling, firing the ball directly into the creature's eye. The creature immediately stopped and grabbed its eye, and began to squirm on the ground with immense pain. More loud shrieks of the creature erupted, and it immediately jumped back over the fence and off into the woods. Eddie's mother saw all of this unfold and ran out to her husband as he did his best to keep his organs from spilling out of his body. Austin ran over to the tent to find bits and pieces of his good friend Eddie all over the place. His body was unrecognizable as the creature had made a mess in his killing. But what was even more bizarre than that was that the creature had destroyed the TV that had the VHS tape inside. The police and the paramedics eventually arrived and took Eddie's dad to the hospital, to which he made a full recovery. Austin, in his efforts, had single-handedly saved Eddie's dad. But from this encounter, there are still so many questions that are left unanswered. What was that creature? Why did it kill Brooks and Eddie? What was on the videotape? But most of all, where did that thing go off to? Tyler and Douglas rode silently as their father drove them to their mother's house in a couple of towns over. On the radio was playing the football highlights from the prior week, but nobody was listening. The two boys were nervous as this would be the first time visiting their mother since she had left their father and didn't know what to expect. The directions eventually took them off the major highways and on several gravel roads before finally arriving at the home. The old home sat back in the woods, just enough to not be seen from any roads. The house was several stories, but looked as if the home hadn't been lived in for years. Sitting out front was their mother, who was wearing a dirty gray t-shirt and messy hair. Logan, the father, parked but briefly waited to see if she would approach the truck to talk to him, but she just stood there on the dimly lit porch. Well, boys, I'm sorry to do this to you, but... She still is your mother, and she has a right to see you, Logan said defeatedly, as the boys hung their heads. Tyler, the oldest, opened the door and was about to say something, but hesitated and exited the truck. Douglas followed him around back to get their bags out of the truck bed before heading towards the old home. The mother stood out front and continued to stare down her ex-husband until the two children finally approached her. Hey, Mom, Douglas said 
but she didn't respond. She just kept staring at Logan's truck. Logan finally pulled out of the driveway and was back on the gravel roads before the mother finally acknowledged her children. Next time he drops you off, I want you to come straight to me. I can't stand the sight of him, she hissed before turning quickly and headed inside. Inside the home, the smell of rotting wood immediately hit your nose. Paint was peeling off the walls and a tarp covered a few of the stairs, leading to the second level. The boys entered with concern, seeing that their mother was clearly not in a good mental space, but also her living situation was borderline unlivable. You two will be sleeping on the couches on the main floor. If you have a problem with it, you can sleep outside, the mother said from the kitchen while holding a cigarette in her mouth. The two boys were too stunned to say anything. The mother that they knew and loved had transformed into this person that neither of them could recognize. It had been months since they last saw their mother, but she was nothing like this. I suppose time and harsh environments can really change people, Douglas whispered to Tyler. The boys set their stuff down on the couches in the living room and saw that neither of them were pull-out couches. On each couch were some old sheets, a towel, and a toothbrush still in the packaging. The two boys started putting the sheets on the couches when the mother came back in. The living room light was able to allow them to see their mother up close and saw that she did not look good. Her skin was pale and her eyes had dark bags under them. She jittered as she spoke and paced the room. All right, listen. For us to get through this, you guys need to follow the rules. I do not care for what you guys do after school, but no one is allowed upstairs ever. And no one is allowed out in the woods after dark. The mother shot a glance over to the two boys who were clearly uncomfortable with this new version of their mother. The boys nodded silently and the mother gave a forced smile. Good, you boys are smart. Just go to school and fix yourself something when you're hungry. I won't be around too much now that I have to work, the mother scoffed. She then grabbed a jacket and left the home and drove off down the dirt road. Tyler and Douglas looked at each other. This is gonna be a long visit, Tyler said while holding back tears. I already miss dad. The boys shared a brief hug before going back to getting each other's couches ready. The boys then investigated the main floor of the home to find that it matched the same level of neglect that the rest of the house had. Seeing how the boys weren't allowed up to the second or third level of the house, they then went outside to play. Both the outside yards were overgrown to the point that they couldn't really play unless it was hide and seek. The backyard woods was thick with brush and weeds, making exploring undesirable. However, after a quick search, the two boys found a small path that led to deeper into the woods. Seeing how they were losing daylight, they figured that this would be something that they would do on another day. They didn't want to get in trouble with their mom on the first day. The two boys went inside and began working on dinner. They weren't sure what time their mother was going to be home, so they made sure to make an extra plate. With how run down the home was, the two boys were surprised to find that the old box television in the living room actually worked. The TV didn't get any channels, but it was hooked up to an old VHS machine, in which they had seven tapes to choose from. The tapes were old cartoon films that their mother must have picked up at a thrift shop or something. At this point, the sun had set, and the sound of crickets and cicadas could be heard buzzing outside. The two boys weighed the options of tonight's entertainment when a strange sound could be heard from upstairs. The house was old and creaked occasionally, but this was different. The sound of a rhythmic banging could be heard ever so slightly. The two boys were initially confused. I think it's a water heater or something, Douglas said while looking to the ceiling. The two boys made their way over to the stairs and looked up. The downstairs light illuminated part of the stairs going up, but aside from that, the stairway was dark. No light could be seen at the top of the stairs. The banging could be heard again, but this time it was slightly clearer. The banging had a strange rhythm this time, much different than it was before, but it definitely came from the same source. Right then, the front door opened and a strange man walked in. The boys froze with fear as they had no idea who this man was. Before either of them could say anything, 
The mother walked in behind him. This is Terry. He is a friend of mine and he will be staying the night. The boys looked at each other shocked as they didn't know their mother was seeing someone else. The man looked older and somewhat dirty but gave a soft smile as he followed their mother up the stairs. Remember, don't go into the woods or come up the stairs, the mom shouted as she and Terry went up the dark stairs. The boys were caught off guard that they forgot to mention the banging that they previously heard and went back to picking out a tape to watch. The two decided on picking the old Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory and sat in their respective couches as they eventually fell asleep. Tyler woke up a few hours later to a silent home excluding the bugs still chirping outside. Tyler removed the blanket on the couch and got up to go to the bathroom. He walked over to the downstairs bathroom and turned on the hanging light bulb that hung in the center of the room. As he was using the bathroom, he then noticed a sound coming from the air vent up above him. The sounds were faint, much like a whisper, but he immediately recognized what it was. It sounded like Terry screaming, but that of pain. Tyler's eyes widened when he made the realization and was unsure of what to do. The screaming stopped and Tyler ran out of the bathroom and over to the bottom of the stairs. This time he could see a faint glow of light and the sound of someone approaching. Unsure of where to go or to even hide, Tyler did the only thing he could think of and laid back down and pretended to sleep. Tyler laid down and positioned himself in a way that he could still see the stairs. The sound of creaking wood could be heard as the silhouette of a skinny woman could be seen coming down the stairs. Tyler tried his best to stay motionless and to regulate his breathing. The skinny figure then did something that immediately terrified him. Once the woman descended the stairs, she quickly went over to his brother, who laid asleep on the adjacent couch, and started to stare at him. She then got close to his face and whispered something before turning to Tyler. The figure then made its way over to Tyler, who then closed his eyes. The creaking wood and the warm breath on his face indicated that she was now inches from his face. She then gently touched his face while whispering, Oh, I love this skin in a much different voice than his mother's. Before he could react, the woman left and went back up the stairs again. Tyler breathed a sigh as the experience truly made him paralyzed with fear. Tyler tried to find sleep, but it never came. His adrenaline and fear made the idea of sleep impossible. When the sun finally rose, he couldn't wait to wake his brother, who was still fast asleep. Doug, Douglas, you need to wake up. Doug groaned and rolled over on the couch, showing no signs of wanting to wake up for the next couple of hours. Tyler then crept over to his bag and pulled out a flip phone that was given to him in case of emergencies and called his dad. His dad was on his way to work, but still answered the phone. Hey buddy, how was your first night? Logan answered cheerfully. Dad, something is weird here. Can you come get us? A sigh could be heard coming from Logan as a small pause followed. You know your mom has you for a couple of weeks, and there's nothing I can do unless she's hurting you. Is she hurting you? Tyler paused as he considered lying to his dad to get him out of there. No, we aren't being hurt, but mom's scaring us. She's being weird. Almost like she's a completely different person. Not even a person, she's just creepy. Logan's curiosity began to change into concern. What do you mean creepy? She's not touching you or doing anything bad in front of you, is she? Again, Tyler considered lying and even thought about telling him about mom's new friend, but knew that that would cause great stress to his dad. No, she isn't doing bad stuff, just being gone for a while and then I saw her watch us sleep, but not in a good way. I can't explain it, dad, but something's off. Logan was clearly torn hearing his boys being so creeped out. Look guys, the situation as of now is that your mom has you guys for three more weeks. If anything happens, call me, but if you're going to call me for every little thing, then it's going to be way harder for all of us. I still love you guys, but you need to try to give your mother a chance. For all our sakes. 
Tyler and Logan said their goodbyes, and Tyler hid the phone again in his backpack. Douglas eventually got up and saw Tyler looking exhausted on the couch. How'd you sleep? Douglas groaned. Tyler rolled to face his brother and whispered, I didn't, as if he didn't want anyone else to hear. Yeah, these couches suck, Douglas said while punching one of the cushions. Tyler wanted to confide in his brother, but didn't want to burden him with what he saw last night. Is that one weird guy still here? Douglas said while stretching. Tyler then realized that aside from his mom being weird, he didn't see anyone come or go. I think he's still here. I didn't see him leave. The two shrugged off mom's weird friend and began working on breakfast. In the kitchen, they could still see that their mother hadn't eaten dinner that they'd made for her last night. The two went ahead and tossed it and started working on breakfast. Fortunately for them, their mother still had a working waffle iron and a little bit of batter, but they couldn't find any syrup. Waffles without syrup should be a crime, Douglas said. The two started eating when they heard a shuffling upstairs, and then the creaking of wooden stairs as someone came down slowly. The two boys looked from the kitchen to see their mother stopped at the base of the stairs and looked at them. She looked much worse than she did from yesterday. Her hair was matted and covered parts of her face. Her posture was bizarre. Her shoulders were slumped over and her arms dangled to the side. Hey mom, Douglas said cautiously unsure if she was hung over or still drugged up. Are you hungry? She just stood there, staring. Her eyes seemed like dark empty sockets, void of life. After a couple of seconds of uncomfortable silence, she turned around and went back upstairs. Douglas and Tyler shared a confused glance and went back to eating breakfast. After breakfast, the two then decided on what to do for the rest of the day. Seeing how there was little to do in the old home, they decided to go outside to keep their distance away from their mother. She would probably appreciate the peace anyways. Outside in the backyard, the high weeds made it tough to play any sports, so they decided to go out into the woods and explore. At their father's house, they had a trampoline and a cool treehouse to hang out and play with friends. But seeing how this new place had none of that, they had to make their own fun. The two then found an old trail and decided to give that a whirl. Worst case scenario, if they got lost, they could just turn back around and find their mom's house with ease. For whatever reason, before Tyler walked down the trail, he glanced back to find a figure standing in the third floor window. The distance and the poor lighting in the house made it difficult to see, but Tyler could make out vaguely someone banging on the window. It appeared that the figure left some type of dark liquid behind on the window that began to slowly drip down. What is that? Tyler yelled to Douglas. Douglas turned around to see what Tyler was talking about, and sure enough, the figure was gone, but the dark liquid remained. Ew, that window looks so gross, Douglas yelled. Did you see the figure banging on it? Tyler asked. I don't think I see a person, but I do see a dirty window. The two stopped and went back inside to talk to their mom about the figure in the window. Once inside, the two called out for their mother, but no answer. A quick look outside confirmed that her car was gone. What should we do? Douglas asked. Should we call mom or even dad and tell them that someone's inside? Tyler thought hard and remembered his phone call with his father this morning. No, we should only call dad if it's an emergency. Let's go check it out ourselves. Douglas looked at Tyler with shock. Mom told us to stay on the main level. We will get into so much trouble if she finds out. Then let's make sure she doesn't find out, Tyler replied. The two looked up the stairs with trepidation and suspense. The dark stairwell leading up looked unmanaged and unsafe. The first step leading up gave a loud creak which caused both boys to immediately retract their step and seriously question what they were about to do. Tyler regained his composure and began his way up the stairs again at a snail's pace with Douglas right behind him. The two made their way to the second story to find the layout in a similar amount of disarray. The walls had fading paint 
and the occasional hole here or there. The floor was just as loud as the stairs, and bits of light could be seen coming through the floorboards. They tried the lights on the second level, and surprisingly enough, the dim bulb came to life to illuminate how poorly the second level really was. Clothes were scattered about, and mold could be seen growing on some of the walls and ceiling. The boys feared this environment, but yet they were compelled to investigate the rest of the house, and also the window where Tyler saw the figure. A smell of rotting food and a mixture of mold hit both of them, making the ability to breathe incredibly difficult. Shuffling and the sounds of chains rattling could be heard above them. The soft sounds of muffled speaking and crying began to grow. Is there someone talking upstairs? Douglas whispered. Who would be up there? I bet it's probably an old TV or something, Tyler reassured. The two went from room to room only to find the second floor in a complete mess. Mounds of newspaper and old furniture filled most rooms, except for one. In one of the rooms towards the front of the house, near the stairwell, was what the boys could only assume to be their mother's room. Inside was a bare mattress that laid on the floor that was covered in dark stains, as well as numerous bottles that were filled with various types of liquids. Dirty towels with blood and other bodily fluids were piled in a corner. On one wall were pages torn from a nudie magazine and glued on, except there were weird writings on the pages that were completely bizarre. Things like, such soft skin, or must not have tattoos on some of the pages. On an adjacent wall were dozens of missing posters with similar writings, but that were much more sinister. Things like, skin too wrinkly, or skin was too old. Douglas began to cry when seeing such horrifying conditions that his mother had been living in. What does any of this mean? Douglas sobbed. Is mom some kind of serial killer? Tyler looked at his brother with equal amounts of fear and concern. The two had seen enough. This was more than enough to call their father and would even justify calling the police. We need to get out of this house. Tyler whispered to Douglas. Before the two could turn to leave, the sound of the front door downstairs opened. The tears from Tyler could no longer be held back as he began to silently cry with his brother. Not sure of what to do, Douglas and Tyler tiptoed over as quietly as they could to one of the cluttered rooms and hid for their lives. The sound of someone climbing the stairs began to grow as the two held their breath, just praying that Whatever looked like their mom would pass them. The noise of the stairs creaking finally stopped when their mother reached the top of the stairs. Their mother began to sniff much like a dog would when investigating something. Boys, are you up here? She said in an oddly calm tone. Tyler bit his fist out of anxiety as warm tears continued to stream down his face. The door to the room that they were hiding in slowly began to creak open when a loud bang was heard upstairs. The door stopped creaking, and their mother walked away to check on the noise. The two boys were paralyzed with fear, but if they were to leave this room without their mother knowing, now was the time. Tyler forced Douglas up, and the two did their best to exit the room as quietly as they could, in their condition. The two descended the stairs as best they could, but the creaks were inevitable. The sounds from upstairs startled the boys as shrieks and screams could be heard coming from the third level. The sounds of chains and multiple people crying out in pain and agony muffled the sounds of the stairs. Tyler ran over to his bag, grabbed his phone, and ran outside with his brother. The two then began running out into the woods while calling Logan to come pick them up. Dad, this is an emergency. You need to come pick us up. We think Mom's trying to hurt us. Logan did his best to calm the boys. Okay, I'm coming to get you now. It's going to take me a couple of hours to get there, but I'm going to send the police to make sure that you're safe. Are you in a safe place? Logan asked sincerely. His tone reflected a similar level of fear as the boys had. No, we aren't. We're trying to hide, but we think that she's looking for us. Douglas and Tyler kept running into the woods when a scream erupted behind them. Boys, screamed the mom. What are you doing out here? Standing a few hundred feet behind them was their mother, 
who looked worse than before. Her hands and forearms were covered in blood, and her hair was wild. Who are you talking to on that phone? Give it to me, she yelled. Tyler hung up the phone. Oh, it was just Dad. I told him everything was fine. She stared at him with hateful eyes, and with an even more hateful expression. Give me the phone, she said in a calm but demanding tone, while extending her blood-drenched hand. Tyler, unsure of what to do, walked over slowly. Are you okay, Mom? Why are you covered in blood? She ignored the question. Tyler handed her the phone and stood there, unsure of what to do. You both need to go inside, now. It's gonna get dark soon, the mom said with no emotion. Douglas stood far off and shook his head, still crying. Come inside, the mother said, but this time with palpable hatred. The two boys reluctantly followed their mother, just hoping that she was unaware of what they had seen. They made it to the house and went inside. Darkness began to creep over the trees and the house as the boys hoped that their father would come through. Once inside, their mother locked the front door and told them to sit down. Tyler, I want to show you something. Follow me upstairs, the mother said coldly. Um, I think I'm okay. Can you show me tomorrow? The mother didn't answer. Mom, can I see it later? She interrupted. Upstairs now, she screamed. Tyler knew if he went upstairs that it was a death sentence or even worse. Unsure of how to get out of this, he shoved her as hard as he could and knocked her over. The mother was cut off guard and hit her head pretty hard on the corner of the coffee table. Blood began to spew as both boys ran into the kitchen. Tyler had a few seconds to find a weapon and use it on his mother before she got up again. The two boys opened every drawer and cupboard in hopes of finding a knife, but no luck. The best option they could find in such a short amount of time was a heavy cast iron skillet that was too heavy for Tyler to wield effectively. Sirens could be heard in the distance, as the boys realized they only needed to hold her off for a few more minutes. Tyler made his way back into the living room, ready to do what he needed to do to make sure that he and his brother were safe. When he saw the most horrific and traumatizing thing in his life, blood continued to flow out of their mother's head, but she was now peeling her skin off, as if it was saran wrap, revealing a gaunt and bony figure beneath. The smell of rotting flesh fumigated the room, as the mother revealed that she was in fact not human. Underneath the dead skin revealed a horrific beast with sharp fangs. The beast was large and much resembled a jackal or a coyote, but had a tinge of some type of demon. Banging could be heard on the front door, as well as screaming. Tyler sprinted to the front door but was intercepted by the skinwalker, who grabbed his shoulder and began to tear his skin. Pain struck Tyler unlike ever before and completely immobilized him. Douglas quickly sprinted over to the door and quickly unlocked it. The door flew open and three policemen entered. Upon seeing the situation, they opened fire on the skinwalker who was still holding Tyler. The flurry of bullets erupted and eventually put down the creature who collapsed onto Tyler, knocking him out. Douglas wept from all the trauma and thought his brother was dead from all the blood. What the heck is this thing? Screamed one of the policemen. The police shouted amongst themselves as they were completely horrified. I think there's something upstairs you guys need to see. Douglas said to the police. The policemen escorted Douglas out while checking up on Tyler. Around this time, Logan pulled up in his truck, alongside more policemen. Logan sprinted and embraced Douglas and asked where Tyler was, and he pointed inside. The police kept the two outside to make sure that the crime scene was safe, and that the evidence would not be tampered with. After a short while, multiple policemen were seen exiting the home and vomiting outside on the porch. The ambulance arrived and they brought out Tyler, who was now awake but was still in great pain. Logan and Douglas made sure that he was okay when the paramedics brought him out on a stretcher. Tyler's pain was so great that he could only shake from the pain. To Logan and Douglas's confusion, the paramedics began bringing out other people. Not one or two, but seven or eight people 
with complete body bandages. Logan approached one of the paramedics and asked what was going on. The paramedic looked around to make sure a supervisor wasn't around and told him what they had found. Apparently on the third floor was a room designated for containing and skinning people alive. These people were all chained to the wall and were completely skinned. It was quite clear whatever this thing was, was luring this people in and using their skin. Aiden sat in school, struggling to pay attention when the intercom came on in class. Aiden Roberts, please report to the front desk. He was so out of it that he barely realized that he'd been called out. But thankfully, the teacher made sure that he heard. He gathered his things, not sure the nature of the call, but when he reached the front office, he saw his mother standing there, holding back tears. She was there talking to the front office staff about some TV show when he walked in. As soon as his mother saw him, she quickly wrapped up the conversation and quickly went over to hug him. Naturally, he was confused. What's going on? Is everything okay? He inquired nervously. His mother never was this shook up, and she never came to school. But seeing her here in this condition made him nervous. It's your grandmother. We're not sure how much time we're going to have with her. He paused, generally confused. Aiden's dad's mom passed away five years ago, and he was forbidden to see his mom's mom, generally due to the result of some nonsense between his mom and grandma. Aiden could tell that his mom felt bad now, especially that her mom was on the brink of passing, and she spent all this time keeping them apart. The two then held hands and walked out to her car. In the car, she told him how her condition had gotten worse and that the doctors figured that she'd have another week or so. So why did you check me out of school? Are we going to see her? His mom was torn by the question. She was still struggling with all the past issues, but seeing how her mom was on her deathbed, all seemed to be forgiven, at least for the time being. The family's going to spend the rest of the week with her. All of us. Before he could give a complaint... His mother gave him a look, telling him that now was not the time. Aiden had plans, but it looked like those had just changed. The drive home, both of them are silent, neither of them wanting to converse about the situation. The two pulled into the driveway, seeing Aiden's father loading up the truck with suitcases and containers of food. It was evident that he was as thrilled as he was, going to have to spend a couple of days with his in-laws, that neither of them knew very well. Aiden had met his grandmother only once, but it had been some time. All he knew about her was that she lived out in the middle of nowhere, and for whatever reason, his mom didn't let them see her. Aiden got out of the car, and his father asked him to quickly pack for roughly a week or so. He quickly did so without protest, seeing how both his parents were either annoyed or saddened with the recent news. In a matter of 20 minutes, all three of them were packed up and on the road. None of them said a word. His father was trying to be supportive while his mother wrestled with her emotions. Aiden sat in the back playing with his Nintendo Switch. He made sure to have the volume off, just in case his parents wanted to share some gossip, and so that he could listen. The family left the suburbs, passed the city, and were now on the Limson Highway, with the occasional oncoming vehicle heading in the opposite direction. It had been a long three-hour drive when Aiden's mother started talking. Okay, so here's the deal. My mother's condition is quite severe. We don't think she's verbal anymore and her mind is beyond repair. Make sure you're quiet around her. She's pretty docile for the most part, but don't startle her. As for Grandpa, make sure you're never alone with him. He doesn't like kids, or at least that's how it was when I last saw him. Also, the land that they live on is, well... No one's allowed outside without a parent, and by no means are you allowed to play in the woods. There's a lot of animals, and it's very easy to get lost. Do we have an understanding? Aiden glanced over his switch to see his mother staring at him with somber eyes. Yes, Mama, he said softly while nodding his head. His parents continued talking, but not to him. 
Their hushed tones told him that whatever they were saying was important, but they didn't want him to hear. About five minutes later, the highway had a turn off which they took and were now on a dirt road. Aiden could see down the dirt road and that empty fields lined both sides. At the end of the road, a good distance away, he was able to see a small farmhome. As they got closer, he was able to see behind the farmhouse that, sure enough, there were thick woods. Once they arrived, there was a single rusted brown Chevy truck parked out front, and an old man standing outside. His face was that of grief and solitude. We got out of the truck, and my mother embraced the man. Surely, this had to be my grandfather. Aiden's father shook his hand, but neither man said a word. The old man then turned to Aiden with his wrinkled face and cracked a toothy smile. You must be Aiden. It's been a while since I last saw you. He didn't hug him like he did his mother, nor shook his hand, but rubbed his worn leathery hand over his head, kind of like a pet. I suppose this was progress, he thought. They followed the old man inside to find the home incredibly dark. The light hurts her eyes, the old man said. Inside, we found that most of the home was lit by small candles. The temperature inside was the same as it was outside, thus still requiring a small jacket to be comfortable. The man led us around the house to finally an open room in which a figure stood in the corner. Immediately, Aiden knew that this must have been his grandmother. But she was concealed by a blanket she wore draping her entire body. Gail, we have visitors for you, the old man gruffed. Clearly, this was a phrase he hadn't said for quite some time. Unsurprisingly, the figure didn't turn. The phrase surely was incomprehensible to the figure. The old man then walked over slowly, making sure not to startle her, and gently turned her around to see the family. The dimly lit room did this woman no favors. Only her face was visible out of the blanket that covered her. Aiden wasn't sure what he expected her to look like, but it wasn't this. Her face was startling from what little he could see in the candlelight. Her milky white eyes clearly viewed nothing as she faced us. Her face was cracked and wrinkled more so than what he had imagined. Her mouth hung open, clearly not by choice, showing us the few teeth that remained. The ones that did were twisted and brown. Your daughter's family's here to see you, the old man said while slowly scooting her over to her chair and making her sit down. The blanket remained on while doing so. Is she supposed to be standing on her own like that? Aiden's mother asked. The old man shook his head. It's the darndest thing, really. She hadn't been able to stand for quite some time, but ever since last week, I have been finding her standing on her own, mainly facing the wall. My dad started to pipe in, but stopped. Well, let us get our stuff situated, and we can come and help you, his mother said. She led us outside and over to the truck. Once by the truck, Aiden's father piped up. Something's wrong with your mother. That didn't look like her, he said out of concern. Aiden's mom shot him a mean glance. Of course that didn't look like her. She's dying. Plus... It's been 10 years since you last saw her, but now you care? Both parents looked at me. Sorry, Aiden. This will be good for us. I know you don't know my mom very well, but this means a lot to me. His parents shared a brief glance before they both went inside while carrying bags. Aiden, you'll be taking my old room, his mom ordered while heading up the stairs. The stairs were dark. No candles lit the way, but his mother plunged through the darkness, leading him to the room. If you couldn't already tell, this home doesn't have electricity, she said without glancing at him. Once up the stairs, the small stream of light could be seen under the doors, lining the hallway. His mother opened the last door on the left, flooding the hallway with natural light. Let's keep this door open so we can see in the hallway, she said. In the room was a single mattress sitting on an old metal bed frame and a dresser. The room was bare. The single window sat unobstructed, filling the room with light from outside. The mattress was old and didn't have a sheet on it, but a single light blanket sat folded at the end of it. His mom sat on the bed and motioned for him to sit next to her. 
This was my room when I was a kid, his mother said softly. Much different than yours. He just looked at her with pleading eyes, begging her to not make him stay here. She looked away, knowing that she was asking a lot for her family, but her guilt-riddled conscience overruled. I'll make it up to you, I promise. I'll buy you any game system you want, just be the good boy that you are and help me get through this. She got up and left the room. Aiden unpacked his stuff and left the room, leaving the door open. The light from the room guided him back to the stairs and back to the main floor. He could hear his parents outside arguing, so he went back to the living room. In the corner of the room, he couldn't help but notice his father placing small logs in the furnace, a detail he didn't notice the first time he was there. He sat quietly in the back of the living room. The warm glow didn't reach far, nor did its heat. It didn't take long for night to come. Aiden's mom started working on dinner and instructed Aiden to light some candles. Aiden went around the house with matches, lighting whatever candles he could find. His father was busy brooding about, making it known that he did not want to be there. Once he finished lighting the candles on the main level, he made his way up the stairs. The home was much warmer now, thanks to the old man keeping the furnace going. The home began to brighten with each candle when Aiden reached the second level. He couldn't find any candles on the second level, so he just went to his room. The room was dark. The window which gave the room its light was now completely filled with darkness. Thankfully, Aiden found a small candle sitting on his bedside table that hadn't been lit in years. Once ignited, Aiden sat next to the candle and pulled out his switch again and began to play. The volume was still off. He played for a few minutes when he thought he heard something in the attic above him. It was a subtle sound, but it sounded deliberate, unlike the natural sounds of an old home settling out in the middle of nowhere. The sound that startled Aiden sounded like footsteps that were directly above him. He placed the switch down and grabbed the candle. The light only reached so far in the dark house. He peered outside his room and glanced in the empty walls. The wooden floors extended to the end of the hallway, and cheap wallpaper lined this miserable stretch of home. The creaks and groans of downstairs drowned out most of the noise. Only in his room was he able to hear the muffled sounds of something upstairs. Aiden was about to descend the stairs and go back to the main floor, hopefully bringing the strange noise to the attention of either parent. But something stood at the base of the stairs, staring up at him. At first, the cloaked figure startled him. He wasn't expecting his grandmother to be standing there, especially so creepily. Aiden was startled, but not afraid, at least at first. As he had descended the few stairs, his estranged grandmother made a bizarre gesture that caused him to stop. The old woman lifted an old and crooked finger to her wrinkled lips, followed by the sound of shh. Aiden was stunned. The sight alone was beginning to grow fear in him. Here stood an old and terrifying woman blocking the exit telling him to be quiet. This was a woman that shouldn't be able to stand, let alone make a choice to tell someone to be quiet. Uh, what? Aiden responded, hoping that the gesture was just a strange thing that she perhaps did due to her dementia or whatever it was that she had. But instead, the old woman lowered her finger and smiled wide. No one will believe you, she whispered. Chill shot through his body, now signaling fight or flight. Aiden took a step back up the stairs and went back to his room, praying that the woman wouldn't follow him. Once out of sight, he sprinted back to the room and closed the door. Aiden sat on the bed, shaking with fear. His adrenaline pumping thick in his system and his senses were heightened. He could hear quick footsteps coming up the stairs and over to his door. Oh no, he thought. Please don't, he whimpered pitifully. The door handle turned, opening the door, revealing Aiden's mom on the other side. What's wrong, dear? She asked. A sigh of relief exited his body and a huge weight was lifted. Oh, mom, it's you. Grandma's acting strange. She was scaring me. The mother walked over to his bed and sat next to him. I know, dear, she said while embracing him. She's scaring me too in her condition. 
She wasn't always like this. Aiden tried to explain what had happened, but his mother cut him off. That's the hard thing with getting older. You see your loved ones slowly deteriorate and become these different people entirely. Thank you for being brave. She stroked his head a few times before standing up. It's time for dinner. I hope you're hungry. Aiden got up and followed his mother out of the room and down the stairs. Sitting at the table were both grandparents and his dad. None of them were talking around the candlelit table. Aiden tried to avoid contact with his grandmother as he sat down. Dinner went as expected. Very little conversation was had. Aiden peered a few times over to his grandmother to see that she wasn't even trying to eat, just staring at nothing. Dinner eventually ended, and everyone went their separate ways. It wasn't terribly late, but Aiden went to his room to call it a night. He wasn't tired, but he just wanted to get away from his creepy grandmother. Something about her was strange. Her dead stare, her mouth just hanging open, but mainly the encounter on the stairs, told him, even though for the slightest of moments, that she seemed to be aware of what she was doing. Aiden played quietly on his switch for the rest of the night, as the battery slowly died. The home was getting colder now. The furnace was no longer being attended to. Aiden wrapped himself up in a blanket and tried to find some sleep, but sleep would never come. The cold mix with the new environment made it difficult to shut his brain off. For some reason, unknown to Aiden, his brain was on high alert. Out of the silence of the cold, dark house came the same sound that he had heard earlier that day, the sound of someone walking above him in the attic. Initially, nothing too bizarre, but it did get his attention. Suddenly, a loud thud banged overhead, as if someone dropped something very heavy onto the floor. This startled Aiden. After a few minutes of staring at the ceiling, trying to listen to what was going on above him, a slow dripping could be heard, coming from somewhere in the room. The hour was late. Everyone was probably asleep by now, but the dripping persisted. At first, the initial theory behind the drip was that it was raining and that the home needed a new roof. But a quick glance outside confirmed that the night was indeed dry. Aiden got up to turn on the lights, but remembered that the home didn't have electricity. Thankfully, he had left the book of matches by his candle in the room. A quick flick of the match illuminated the room. The small candle was lit and began burning the little wax that it had left. It didn't take long for Aiden to find the source of the drip. A pool of dark liquid gathered on the floor, most of which being absorbed by the wood. Aiden looked up to find a dark spot on the ceiling that was producing the drip. It then dawned on Aiden that the loud bang and the dripping were definitely related. This was not good. It wasn't so much that the dripping itself had concerned Aiden, but rather the color. It was hard to tell in the orange candlelight, but if he didn't know any better, this liquid looked very much like blood. Before he could hop back into bed, a scream could be heard, although muffled, somewhere on the main floor. It sounded feminine in nature, most likely his mother. It had to be. Aiden's blood chilled at the sound, but quickly found himself leaving his room to investigate. He entered the dark hallway and creaked across the floors to the stairs. All the candles in the house were extinguished, making the old wooden home incredibly dark save it be the one that he was holding. Aiden went down the stairs to where he thought he heard the scream. It just so happened that he was going in the direction of his mother's room. At that moment of rather poor fortune, the small candle that was guiding him went out. Oh no, he whispered. He placed the candle down and tried to find another, but realized he left all the matches upstairs. It was useless. He stood in the middle of the house in complete darkness, unsure of what to do. However, before he could decide on his own, he heard a shuffling and something heavy being dragged. Aiden felt around for anything to guide him away from the base of the stairs, and eventually felt a wall and then a knob. Aiden twisted the knob and entered the small closet that he had found. Old clothes and a broom pushed against him as he entered the closet and closed it partially. To his surprise, a soft glow entered his field of view, 
as he saw an old man holding a candle walk past the door. For a brief moment, Aiden thought about exiting his hiding place, but his mind screamed at him. The old man walked by, this time escorting his wrinkled wife, but the scene that laid before him paralyzed him with fear. His grandmother was no longer wearing the blanket that concealed most of her body. This time, she was exposed, revealing that her true form was something much more sinister. The grandmother's shape was no longer human, not even close. The face of the grandmother looked the same, but everything else looked demonic in nature. Her size was much bigger, but it wasn't the size or the features of the grandmother that scared him so much, but rather what she was holding. Dragging behind the grandmother was what little remained of Aiden's mom. Slashes covered the body and several limbs were missing. The grandmother was dragging Aiden's lifeless mother by the hair and went up the stairs. Streaks of rich blood trailed behind, leaving a morbid reminder of what had happened only moments before. Go ahead and put this with the other one in the attic, the old man said. I'll take care of the kid. Aiden wanted to cry for help, but knew that his father surely had met a similar fate. The old man and the creature pretending to be his grandmother went up the stairs, dragging the remains. Small thuds could be heard as torn flesh went up each stair. Once they were out of view, Aiden left his hiding spot and went to the front door. A quick attempt on the front knob revealed that the door was in fact locked. Aiden silently went to any possible opening to try to free himself from this realm of horror, but all potential exits were tightly sealed. Aiden began to cry, seeing how escape wasn't an option. He knew that the only way to free himself was to fight his way out. Aiden's eyes had slowly adjusted to the dark, and he went to find a weapon. His 12-year-old body was no match for the horrifying beast hand to hand. But perhaps, if he found a large enough knife or a weapon to level the playing field, then, and only then, did he stand a chance. Aiden slowly made his way to the living room. The dull glow of the embers dying in the furnace gave enough light to reveal a fire poker made from some rusted iron laid near the furnace. Aiden quickly went over and picked up the poker, feeling its hefty weight. Its wooden handle was worn, but gripped tightly against his hand. Aiden knew that he must take on the old man first, then the creature. He certainly couldn't take on both at once. The thought briefly came across his mind that perhaps the old man was also a creature in disguise. If this was the case, then he was surely dead. The sound of someone frantically pacing above and eventually descending the stairs creaked throughout the house. Aiden quickly tried to find a hiding place, but no suitable option presented itself. A glow streamed from the other room, and it began to get brighter, indicating to Aiden that the old man was coming. He hid behind the entryway of the room and readied his weapon to swing with all his might. His hands continued to sweat as the figure then entered the room. Aiden swung, hitting the old man square in the head, knocking him over. The old man dropped the candle, which nearly extinguished the light. The surprise attack was successful. The old man laid in pain as his head began to bleed from its recent crack, but the old man was not dead. It was enough to knock him over, sure, but there was still enough life in him to fight back. The old man was disoriented, but tried to get back up. Aiden swung again, this time hitting him in a less vital area. The man fell again, but tried almost instantly to grab the poker from Aiden. Aiden continued to swing until the old man lay lifeless on the ground. Little remained of his face and head as Aiden made sure that his attacker would never get up. A quick check of the old man's body confirmed that he did not have a key to any of the doors. He would need to face this creature head on. Quick movements from upstairs told him that he needed to hide. Aiden took his same hiding spot from before, but just out of view in the doorway. A mixture of tears and blood splattered covered his face as he readied the same poker. This time, the grip was much more slippery. He gripped with both hands, ready to render the monster's flesh into pulp, much like its accomplice, but the creature never did come down the stairs. Aiden waited for a few moments, his adrenaline still pumping through his body, 
when he began to notice that the candle that the old man had dropped had started to catch the wooden floor on fire. He debated only briefly to pick up the candle and to extinguish the flame, but then it dawned on him. The chances of him actually killing this thing were unknown. If he were to die, he wanted to make sure that this thing would go with him. He let the candle burn, continuing its spread across the floor and onto the walls. Tired of waiting, Aiden went up the stairs to confront the beast. The glow from downstairs shined through the room and up partially to the second floor. Aiden's gut told him to follow the blood trail. Surely at the other end, he would find his only source of escape. The blood led from the stairs down the hall to another set of stairs, leading up to the attic. The attic received no light from the burning house. Aiden went to his room, grabbed his switch, and turned it onto the home screen as a light source. In the room, the dripping from above had a steady stream of blood, dripping from the ceiling and walls. The monster must have put the bodies in the attic, right above his room, which would explain the blood trail. The flash of the switch reflected off the window, reminding him that the second story room had a window, aka a way out. It then dawned on him that his exit was right in front of him. Without thinking, Aiden smashed the window with the poker, notifying to whoever remained in the house of his location. Loud footsteps were heard above him as he cleared the window of its glass. Smoke now filled most of the house and flames began consuming most of the main floor. The window was clear and Aiden had crouched through the window to free himself when a loud bang was heard on his room's door. The creature began to beat the door in almost effortlessly. A head-on battle with this beast would surely end his life almost instantly. Aiden was halfway through the window when the door splintered open. The large beast entered the room, seeing its last remaining prey trying to flee and lunged its massive talon-filled claw at Aiden. The swipe struck his side, pushing him out the window. Aiden cried from the pain and fell landing awkwardly outside. He landed flat on his back and heard a loud crack. His body exploded with pain. Fearing for his life, he looked up to the window to see the creature trying to follow him, but the window was too small. Aiden tried to stand, but could no longer feel his legs. Blood began to flow freely from his side as his encounter with the beast came at a high price. The house was now burning as the smoke filled the air. Shrieks from inside hurt his ears as he knew that he was slowly killing the beast. He lay on the ground and continued to bleed. No one was coming to save him. This house was too far off that even a mountain of flames would not be able to notify anyone. He just lay there, streams of tears on his face. The screams from inside eventually stopped, and for Aiden's last few moments, he produced a small smile, knowing that he had killed the thing that had killed his family. Aiden continued to smile as his vision slowly faded away. St. Mark's Private School was allegedly haunted since the Civil War. Many of the students and even some of the teachers had seen and heard strange things, whether inside the school during the school hours or even outside after close. This had gathered the attention of many people, including those not in attendance at the school. Many private companies and even a couple of television networks had offered to pay money to come and investigate the school after hours. The principal, Walter Hayward, being a devout leader in both the scholastic and religious departments, had tried his best to snuff any claims of the school being haunted by spirits. At first, he tried to simply ignore the claims and let the rumors die down. Things began to get out of hand when multiple break-ins would occur, causing him to hire on-campus security for after hours. Nothing would be stolen, and aside from maybe a door or a window, nothing would be broken or vandalized. He then put into effect high punishments for those caught on school grounds trying to conduct any type of paranormal investigation. The campus was located on a plot of land that backed against thick woods. Many speculated that somewhere in the forest behind the school was a graveyard or some type of burial ground. No evidence supported this claim, but many people have tried to make sense of the school's high paranormal activity. The high school, despite being very old, was actually quite large. 
A big portion of the size came from later renovations, from generous donors making St. Mark's, the second largest private school in the state. Jason and Matt were both seniors, attending the school with hopes of attending college to become film directors. They would make low-budget films and enter into contests around the state and would often win. They had eventually won enough prize money to purchase a decent camera, along other equipment to make pretty decent content. A studio producer caught wind that not only these two attended the highly coveted private high school, but they were also able to film high-quality content footage, and an idea came into place. Matt looked at his phone and saw that Jason was calling him at 11 o'clock at night. Matt hit the ignore button and rolled over, seeing that he had to get up early for swim team. Matt's phone rang again, with the same contact revealing that Jason was calling. Matt answered. What does this clown want? Matt grumbled under his breath. Bro, you're not going to believe the offer I just got. Matt was disoriented from just waking up and now from the screaming. Dude, I don't care. I have to wake up at 5 tomorrow. The Travel Channel just offered me 10 grand to stay the night at the school and conduct a paranormal investigation. Matt was unfazed by this. Okay, that's definitely not a scam. Good for you. Matt was about to hang up the phone when Jason piped in. You know that I want you in on this. I'll split it with you 50-50. An easy 5 grand. Plus, you told me yourself that you don't believe in ghosts anyways. The realization began to sit in with Matt. Wait, five grand for one night's work? Before Matt got too excited, he remembered that the school had now had security that would walk the halls to make sure that no one did exactly this. Jason, if we get caught, we won't get to walk at graduation. Principal Hayward's been so uptight about this kind of stuff all year. Jason laughed. We're not gonna get caught. I have a perfect plan. Thursday, we hide in the gym after school. Security will inspect the school and lock up, and we spend the night investigating. The next morning, we'll go to class like nothing happened. It'll work. The two then made plans of how the night would go. At first, they'd walk around the school to see which area got the most activity. From there, they'd conduct a Ouija board session to see if they could communicate with any spirits. Then, to cap it all off, they'd both go their own way to investigate to cover more ground. They then would find a room in which they'd stay for the rest of the night and get ready for school the next day. It was a high-risk, high-reward situation. Worst case scenario, if they got caught, they then just wouldn't walk at graduation but would still be able to get a huge payoff. The next day, the two got their filming equipment ready and loaded up in their cars and drove to school. They also made sure to bring a change of clothes to give the effect that they went home and changed. That Thursday dragged on like every other day, but more so. Matt and Jason scouted the school and made mental notes of areas to investigate throughout the school day. Eventually, the end of the day came, and Matt waited in the locker room waiting for Jason to arrive with the rest of the equipment. To his surprise, Jason walks in with his girlfriend, Clara, who is holding half of the equipment. Matt and Clara have been at odds since she and Jason had started dating that year. Matt immediately began to protest. Whoa, dude, you didn't say anything about bringing your girlfriend. She's gonna get us caught. Oh, please, Matt, you just don't want me here. The two began to fight when Jason stepped in. Look, Claire has experience in conducting paranormal investigations, and she has special equipment to talk to spirits. Plus, I promised her my half of the cut, not yours, so you're still gonna get your fair share. Clara and Matt shared a tense moment before they went about their own ways to get prepped for tonight's investigation. All right, so here's the deal. We have to be careful in our investigation, mainly because the school hires security to come every couple of hours to make sure people aren't ghost hunting, like us. Let's make sure not to be too loud. When we hear the guards coming, we turn off our lights and find a good hiding spot, Matt said, making sure everyone was on the same page. Jason and Clara nodded. Jason checked his watch. Okay, it's 5 o'clock now. Most teachers and even the janitor should be wrapping up on their day's work. We'll come out of here at 6 and check the school to make sure that everyone left. The three students played on their phones for the next hour when Jason's alarm went off on his phone. 
They all shared a glance, as if to see who would go out and check to see if all the teachers had left. Matt decided to go check the school, feeling awkward that Clara was being there. Matt slowly exited the locker room and made his way into the dark gymnasium. The dark hollow gym was much different now than during school hours. The normal busy gym was now filled with shadows and suspense. Matt felt incredibly uneasy, especially since he wasn't supposed to be there. He tried his best to silently cross the wooden floor of the gym, but the silence made his footsteps echo louder than they would normally. He made his way across the gym and finally into the main portion of the school. He peeked his head out of the door and made sure both ends of the halls had no lights on. Save it be the emergency lights and the glowing exit sign on both ends. Teachers seem to be gone. I wonder about the janitor, Matt whispered to himself. Matt entered the hallway and closed the gym door as quietly as the door would let him. Matt then sped walked down the hall, peering into each classroom on the way to make sure that the school was truly empty. The school seemed much bigger, especially now that he had appeared into each classroom. Matt turned the corner of the long hallway and stopped in his tracks. About four classrooms away, one of the classroom doors was opened and the light spilled out into the hall. Matt froze and held his breath. Before Matt could turn around and walk back, the light to the room turned off. Matt expected a teacher or a janitor to exit the room, but no one did. Seconds turned into minutes when Matt realized no one was going to exit the room. Did Matt already see paranormal activity? Matt inched closer to the room, half expecting an exhausted teacher to come out, but they never did. Matt finally reached the doorway and peered inside. The only light inside the room was from a lamppost that glowed from the back of the school's courtyard next to the woods. The room was empty, but something caught his eye outside. Outside under the lamppost standing in the school's courtyard was a man. His features were obscured by the distance and the harsh angle of the light making Matt feel uneasy. Before Matt could process what this meant, the figure walked into the dark woods behind him. What was that? Matt whispered. Matt pressed on, making sure that the facility was empty, before he started his investigation. The thought of the strange man outside seemed weird. Why was he there? Was he able to see me, or was he just passing by, and just happened to look in my direction? Thankfully, he wouldn't have to worry about this weird man, as long as he stayed inside. Matt checked the rest of the building and called it good. The school had two other detached buildings on campus, and one currently under construction, but they would just focus the investigation on the main building. Matt returned to the locker room and informed the two that the school was now clear, but Matt didn't mention anything about the man outside in fear that it would cause concern for the investigation. The group got their equipment ready and exited the locker room, ready to investigate. The school was empty but was filled with shadows. Some of the classrooms were open while others were closed and locked. Where do we begin? Clara asked. Matt and Jason looked at each other and realized that they were ready to investigate. I guess let's go room to room to see if we can capture anything. The group started the investigation in the front office, where the principal's office and the teacher's lounge was. They kept the lights off to prevent anyone from seeing them from the street and used flashlights. The principal's office was locked, so the group tried the teacher's lounge. The door had been locked, but not closed all the way. Matt and Jason pushed on the door and it swung open. The lounge was a room that neither of them had been in before. It was hard to get a good feel for the room since they only had flashlights. Claire set up a Ouija board in the middle of the floor and started to light candles, while the two guys looked around. Jason found a ring of keys in one of the drawers that looked to have every room key to the school. He picked up the heavy ring of keys and put them in his backpack for later. Remember, we need to put these back before school starts tomorrow, Jason said to Matt. Matt and Jason continued to search the room and stumbled across a very peculiar door. In the corner of the teacher's lounge was an old metal red door with a sign that said, Danger, Maintenance Corridor, Do Not Enter. Jason and Matt looked at each other and at the door and began to ponder. Should we check this out? We will never get another chance to investigate. 
Jason got the large ring of keys out and began trying to find the right one to open the door. Clara had begun a Ouija session and started asking questions to nearby spirits. Jason finally found the key to the door and unlocked it. To his surprise, the door didn't lead to outside or to some miscellaneous back room, but rather a set of stairs that led downwards. Matt shined his flashlight down the stairs, but it didn't reach the bottom. The stairs were old and wooden, and the walls were made out of old stone. Wires hung from the walls and ceilings in the stairwell, but no lights were installed. Guys, come here. We have to check this out, Jason said with extreme excitement. The group walked over and looked into the stairwell with mixed reactions. Matt smiled and nodded, but Clara felt something way off about this place. Oh, there's got to be some ghosts down there for sure, Matt said while grabbing Jason on the shoulder. Matt stepped on the old wooden stairs and the wooden frame began to creak. One at a time on the stairs, Matt said while descending into the darkness below. Clara grabbed Jason and whispered, Jason, I'm getting weird vibes about this. I've never felt this type of evil before. Jason was preoccupied with getting his camera ready. That's good, right? Hopefully we can capture it on camera. Jason followed down the stairs once he couldn't see Matt. Clara waited at the top of the stairs, debating on whether to follow Matt and her boyfriend. She waited as Jason disappeared below into the darkness, until she couldn't see his flashlight anymore. Meanwhile, in the teacher's lounge, Clara waited for either Matt or Jason to reappear, but they never did. A couple of minutes passed and she began to feel paranoid in the dark teacher's lounge, all by herself. Jason? Matt? She called down into the dark stairwell, but no answer. She planned on waiting at the top of the stairs for either the boys to reappear, but that plan was thrown out the window when a light in the hallway turned on. Standing on the other side of the door was an outline of a figure. It was either a security guard coming to check the school or a shadow person. Either way, she wasn't going to wait around to find out. Clara quickly gathered her things pushed them under the couch in the lounge and went down the stairs while closing the door behind her. She could hear the teacher's lounge door open on the other side. Light from under the door shined briefly and went away as the sounds of footsteps left the lounge. Clara held her breath to make sure whoever or whatever it was that had entered the lounge didn't know of her presence. She waited for a few minutes in the dark for good measure before trying the door again. To her shock, the door was locked. She tried frantically to push on the door, but the door latch must have locked her in by mistake. Panic began to set in when she realized that Jason had all the keys. Surely he'd be able to get them out of there. Clara turned on her flashlight and turned around to see the numerous stairs leading into the darkness. Nothing worth value could possibly be down below, except for her boyfriend and the prospect of escape. She began to descend the stairs with the same creaking and groans she heard before. The temperature began to drastically change the further down she went. The stairs seemed to go on way past her expectations that any basement to any building she'd ever been in. She finally reached the bottom, and to her dismay, she did not find Matt or Jason. What she did find was what seemed to be an intersection of multiple tunnels. That's not what made her so fearful. Either by design or by some nefarious neglect, one of the flashlights was on the ground and leading into one of the tunnels. Clara left the light on the ground and made her way into the tunnel in hopes to either finding Jason or Matt. Jason! Matt! She cried as she walked into the tunnels in hope of finding anyone to get her out of here. The tunnel was dark but echoed every sound Clara made, causing her to be more frightened than she already was. Shuffling could be heard in the distance, which caused her to speed up in hopes of finding one of the boys. Jason! Matt! She screamed, the sound echoing down the long tunnel in hopes of one of them hearing it, causing them to turn around. The shuffling up ahead had stopped. Someone had hurt her. She continued, but now something was off. To her surprise, no one responded. But rather, it was as if whoever was making the noise stopped in order to conceal themselves rather than to make their presence known. The thought finally dawned on her. What if Jason and Matt weren't the only ones down here? 
Clara stopped on her tracks and turned off her flashlight. She waited in the darkness, trying her best to muffle her heavy breathing that was now on the verge of crying. Her eyes strained in the darkness, trying her best to adjust to her surroundings without giving away her position. Up ahead, she could barely make out a glow of a light that moved against the wall of the tunnel. She moved forward, but something in her survival instincts told her to remain as silent as possible. She shuffled forward to the end of the tunnel and eventually saw that the tunnel turned a corner and opened into a larger atrium. She peeked from around the corner and saw that the light source was another flashlight, but this time it was in Matt's hands. However, Matt's lifeless body was on the ground and sitting on him was a naked human-like creature. The creature was crouched like Gollum on Matt's collapsed ribcage and the creature was holding Matt's decapitated head. The creature was speaking into Matt's ear, and then turning Matt's head, putting the mouth up against the creature's ear, expecting Matt to respond. The creature was speaking, but it wasn't English. Clara could feel eyes shoot throughout her entire body, and warm tears begin to well in her eyes as the creature stood up to an unnatural height, revealing a gaunt physique. The side profile of the creature revealed, despite looking human, its face lacking ears or a nose. Clara began to backpedal, without taking her eyes off the creature. Please don't notice me, she thought to herself. The creature then proceeded to drag Matt's lifeless body by the ankle with one hand and carried his head by the hair in the other. The creature dragged his body to the dark corner of the atrium, out of her sight. Clara faced the creature and backed as far as she could before being out of earshot of that thing. She then turned to begin walking and turned on her flashlight. At the end of the tunnel, she saw a figure walking in her direction. It was only for a brief second, but she immediately turned off her light. Whatever was at the end of the tunnel must have seen her, as a shuffling noise could be heard walking towards her. To her surprise, the figure then turned on a flashlight and called out to her. Clara, is that you? Jason said down the tunnel. Clara felt a wave of relief as she turned on her flashlight and sprinted to Jason. Jason, we have to leave, Clara said while trying not to cry. There's something down here with us. It killed Matt, she said, letting her emotions get the better of her. Jason stood puzzled and confused. Matt's dead? I just saw him a couple of minutes ago. There's no way. You need to trust me. We need to leave now. Jason looked concerned and unsure of what to do. Do you still have the keys to the maintenance door? We need to get them and get out of here. Jason put down his backpack and fished around for the keys, pulling out the key ring and handed it to Clara. Before the two began their way back to the entrance of the tunnel, they heard a voice coming from the atrium. Jason, Clara, something said. Jason and Clara shared a confused look and Jason began to laugh. That was messed up. You really had me going. Clara had a look of terror as she began to plead with Jason to leave with her. Jason began walking towards the direction of the voice, but Clara tried to stop him. Jason, that isn't Matt. I saw Matt without his head. Something killed him. Matt slowly began to enter the field of vision of James' flashlight. The figure very much looked like Matt, but he sounded much different than what he normally did. His voice was raspy and diluted, as if something was wrong with his lungs. Clara's fight or flight kicked in and left Jason in the tunnel. The creature knew immediately that it had been discovered and rushed Jason while screeching. The screams of Jason filled the tunnel as he began to be attacked by that thing that killed Matt. But that wasn't all. More screeches could be heard in other tunnels, indicating that there were more of these things down here. Clara grabbed on tightly to the key ring as she finally made it out of the tunnel and back to the set of old wind stairs. She sprinted up the stairs two at a time as the screams got closer. She ascended the stairs and finally reached the top and tried finding the key which opened the door. She tried her best to fish around the dozen of keys that were on the ring, but none seemed to work. She could hear more of those things coming closer in the tunnel. With only luck to guide her, she placed one of the keys into the door and twisted it. The door lock opened and she pushed open the door. 
Waiting for her on the other side was a security guard and the principal. The guard was holding a gun and the principal shined a flashlight in her face. Well, 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 Miss Claire. Looks like curiosity got the better of you, Principal Hayward said with a slight hint of disappointment. Clara tried to push past them to get to safety, but the guard took her keys and pushed her back into the stairwell. Oh, no, no, sweetie. You and your friends wanted to investigate so badly, so now you have to deal with what you found. The security guard then shot her in the stomach, causing her to fall down a few of the stairs. The creatures then swarmed her as the guard closed the door and locked it. The Room I don't remember my sister Aubrey very much, at least the real Aubrey. She was seven and a half years older than me, which alone was a big enough barrier that we didn't really get to know each other. However, what made things worse was her advanced cancer in her body. She was constantly in and out of hospitals due to her condition, which made it very hard for her to have a normal childhood. If I was lucky, my parents would take me to see her on the weekends, or if she was home, she was not really feeling up to doing much, which I don't blame her. Things with her would slowly get worse when I'd get into middle school. I remember the whole family came to spend some time with her before the inevitable was going to happen. As hard as things were for me, I knew that my sister had it way worse. On one of the weeks of my sister's passing, my mom's brother, Uncle Rob, came to stay with us for a few days. Uncle Rob was the coolest. He was my mom's older brother who lived out of state, but he was the coolest guy. He drove a big truck and co-owned a construction company, which made him secretly wealthy. Rob grew up with only sisters and had no kids of his own. So, for whatever reason, when he came to visit, he made sure to make me feel special. I'm willing to bet that it had to do with the fact that I reminded him of himself. The Saturday he came to visit, he woke me up extra early, I think around 6 or so in the morning. My parents were still at the hospital with my sister, so Uncle Rob and I had the house to ourselves. At first, Uncle Rob waking me up on a Saturday at 6 was incredibly annoying. However, it didn't take him long to make me smile. Hey Jake, let's give your gaming setup an upgrade, he said while hitting me in the head with the pillow. I sat up in bed and rubbed my eyes. My mom was strict on what I did with my free time. She didn't like the idea of me playing video games in another room when I could be spending time with family or with my sister, which was fair. But kids are allowed to have fun every now and then. But Uncle Rob... I don't have a gaming setup, I said as I began to stretch. Oh my gosh, it's even worse than I thought, he said while pretending to write on a piece of paper and handed it to me. Here, it's your prescription to have a cool gaming setup, effective immediately. I smiled and got out of bed. Meet me in the truck in two minutes, we got a lot of work to do today, he exclaimed as he left my room and went out to his truck. I quickly got ready and met him out there. The early morning chill bit my face, but his warm truck quickly remedied this problem. So here's the deal, my fuzzy little friend. I did some measurements and I noticed that one of the rooms in your basement has a huge closet, my uncle said as he pulled out of the driveway. I'm willing to bet you that I could build you a secret room connected to that closet and none of your parents would know. Perfect for a gaming room. What do you think? My eyes lit up even more. How would we do that? I asked, astonished. My parents will be home tonight. There's no way that we're going to get away with this. Uncle Rob gave me a look that said, Do you not know who I am? I've been sneaking stuff past your sister all my life, and I've never been caught yet. Plus, you forgot that I'm the best, and I can do anything. Uncle Rob took us to Home Depot and picked out some drywall, paint, and other materials to help make this thing happen. He had all the tools he needed, in the back of his truck. After Home Depot, we stopped by a GameStop and picked up a new console with games, controllers, and even a headset. All right, now I'm counting on you not to get caught playing too much. And if you do, don't tell them that I gave you the stuff, he said while smiling. 
We went back home and began working on the room immediately. The basement had been recently finished, but there were still supplies and debris left behind. Uncle Rob started right away and cut a four-foot rectangular hole in the closet wall and got to work. Sure enough, behind the wall was a small opening, about eight feet by five feet. Ideally, this was a small space to not really be able to do anything. But for a secret gaming room, this was perfect. After a couple of hours of laying carpet, building the setup and covering the hole with a new piece of painted drywall, the secret game room was complete. At this point, I hadn't played much video games. Uncle Rob was able to show me a few things, but it took me a while to really get into it. My parents came home that night, and Uncle Rob and I said nothing about the cool room we just made. However, the excitement of the fun day came to a screeching halt, as we were told by my parents that my sister's condition had gotten worse. Uncle Rob went home the next week, and my sister ended up having to stay at the hospital. Aubrey, my sister, ended up having complications in the next couple of months and passed right before my 13th birthday. Things were never the same, not just for me, but for my parents. But as cruel as fate was, I still had to grow up without my sister, and my parents had to move on. Four years later, I was on track to graduate high school and worked a job as a pizza delivery guy in my town. My town was small, so small that the beater truck that my parents gave me was able to handle the load of driving pizzas to the locals. Even at this point, my parents had no idea that my uncle Rob had completely made a new room tucked away in the basement. I was able to talk to my parents into changing rooms so that the hidden game room was in my closet and the basement. I was needing money for college, so I worked overtime at the local pizza place in town. Most people knew me or my parents, so the job was pretty chill for most of the time. However, there were a few times that, driving late at night, that I thought I would see something, either in the road or just off the shoulder. Driving to drop off the last pizza for the night, I was driving to the more remote part of the town. It was early December, and the Colorado winter already provided snow to our small town. Most cars here are either equipped with 4x4 abilities or... The drivers are experienced enough to not have any issues. I was driving down the dark street to deliver the pizza when my headlights came across a flipped vehicle. It took me a couple of seconds to process what I was looking at. Smoke could be seen coming from the exhaust of the overturned car, and the hazard lights were weakly flashing. Oh no, I thought, as I put my truck in park and got out to help. I called 911 on my phone and went to see if the person driving was okay. The way the vehicle was facing, I couldn't see inside the driver's side. Out of curiosity, I walked over to the driver's side just to make sure that everyone was okay. Sure enough, sitting in the driver's seat was an older woman. She was upside down but still buckled in the seat. The vehicle was still running and the woman was surprisingly not injured, save it for a small scratch on the forehead. Hey, are you okay? I asked while peering into the car. Oh, I'm fine. Just a bit embarrassed is all. I can't believe I just did that. I just bought this car, the woman said embarrassed. Don't worry about the car, ma'am. All that matters is that you're okay. I already called 911 and that they're on their way. Do you need anything? Do you want me to stay till they get here? Thank you so much, young man. Well... I can't really get out of this car the way it's positioned, so there's not really much more you can do for me. But thank you, the woman said politely. Well, I'll tell you what. I have to deliver this pizza really quick down the road, but when I'm done, I'll come back and wait with you until help arrives. I said in hopes to help calm the woman, or at the very least, to be polite. That's not necessary, but thank you for calling for help. I don't live far from here. I can call my husband to come help me. I walked back to my truck and got in. I was able to find the customer's residence, despite the home itself being poorly lit. A large man answered the door and handed me a crumpled $20 bill. I handed him two pizzas he ordered and offered him change, but he told me to keep it. I glanced at my watch and it was now 11.03. We were technically closed at 11, and I should have driven straight back and clocked out. 
but seeing how I would need to pass the rack back home into town anyways, I decided to check up on the woman and make sure that help knew where to find her. I drove back to the dark road and the car was still there and running. Help had yet to arrive. I knew that the woman told me that I didn't have to check up on her, but I did what I would want someone to do if myself or a loved one got in a wreck and went to check up on them. The time I spent delivering that pizza could not have been more than five minutes. So naturally, I didn't expect the circumstance to change much. I got out of my truck and walked back over to the driver's side. However, something was different. As I approached the driver's side, I noticed blood coming from the driver door and leading out into the snowy woods. Did she somehow get out of her overturned car? I asked myself, but then I realized that the blood was far greater than when it was about seven minutes ago when I last talked to her. I began to worry for the woman as it would appear that her injuries were far greater than initially thought. I held my breath as I knew I was about to see something I wasn't ready for. I peered inside the car and sure enough, the top half of this woman was gone. Her bottom half was still hanging upside down and buckled into the seat, but the top half had been viciously removed. I gasped. Did something take her while I was out delivering this pizza? Or did I imagine that she was still alive? I looked to where the blood led to, which was directly into the woods that surrounded the road. I walked over out of curiosity to see if perhaps something did take her. The dark night made peering into the woods nearly impossible. I pulled out my phone and turned on my flashlight to get a better look. The blood led deeper into the woods which was begging for me to investigate on my own. But seeing how I was next to the woods and something just killed this woman, I wanted to get back to safety. I walked back to my truck and waited for help to arrive, which they did about 10 minutes later. The first to arrive were paramedics. They parked behind the overturned vehicle and started doing what they could do to recover the body. I got out to tell them what had happened, but I was still in shock. Did you call this in? A man asked as he walked up to me. Uh, yes. Yes, I did. I was driving by and I saw this car and called you guys. The paramedics talking to me thanked me and began walking back to the crash site when I said softly, I talked to this woman when I drove by. She wasn't dead yet. The paramedic stopped and walked back to me. What was that? He said as he got really close to me. Yeah. When I called you guys, the woman driving the car was still alive. I had to leave her to deliver this pizza and came back and she was dead. The paramedic looked at me and shined a small light into my eyes. Are you sure about this? You talked to her? Of course, and she was, for the most part, fine and coherent. The paramedics walked me back to my truck. Listen, pal, thanks for the call and everything, but forget what you saw here tonight. Don't say anything to anyone, okay? It's for your safety. If you say anything to anyone about this, then they'll know, and they'll come for you. The paramedic then opened my truck door for me and told me to get out of here before the police arrived. Obviously, I didn't ask questions. I got out of there as quickly as I could while still being safe. I could see the other emergency vehicles ahead in the direction that I just left from. I got back to the pizza shop later than anticipated and got an earful from my boss. What took you so long? That drive should have taken you 20 minutes tops. I hesitated before speaking, remembering what the paramedic told me. Um, sorry. There was a crash and I had to call 9-1 for them. My manager gave me a look to see if I was lying, but ended up not caring anymore seeing how he was about to clock out. Okay, whatever. Just be more mindful, he said as he locked up for the night. I drove back home wishing I had someone to tell about this experience, but I was so shook up with what just happened. Did me leaving get that woman killed? Or had I stayed would I have ended up like her? These are questions that haunted me when I went inside my house. The lights were off inside. My parents were early birds, so they would probably been asleep for a few hours now. I was tempted to wake them up to tell them what had happened, but I figured it was something that could wait till morning. 
Thankfully, the weekend was here, and I didn't have to go to school the next day, and my shift for the pizza restaurant wasn't until nighttime. So, like any teen being bored, I went to my room into the basement, and went into my hidden gamer room. I normally enjoyed staying up late, but something about this night was off. Perhaps it had to do with the fact that I was tired from school and work, or having to deal with seeing that top half of the older woman removed from their body being too much. But nonetheless, something about this night didn't feel right. Around two or so in the morning, I got a text from my mom. Are you making that noise? I looked at my phone confused. What noise? I replied. My setup was nearly soundproof being in the basement. My parents shouldn't have even heard me scream if I did that, but I was being completely silent. My mom's text, for some reason, gnawed at the back of my head as I continued to play. About an hour later, I got another text. Where are you? Now I was scared. Why was my mom asking where I was at 3 in the morning? I was about to call my mom when I received another text from her. But the text didn't have any words, but two pictures. The first picture was taken in my parents' bedroom. The perspective was as if someone was standing at the foot of their bed. Two figures could still be seen in bed, but their conditions were unknown. The next image is what really concerned me. It was mostly blurred with light, as if someone took a selfie too close and the flash was on, but I was able to make out two things from the image. The first was the eye of whoever took the picture. Whosever eye was in this picture, their pupil was not circular, but rather, a bar, much like that of a goat. The second thing that I noticed, in the bottom right hand corner of the image, was a mouth that resembled a dog or a wolf's. I paused. My mom was not one for jokes. She had become much more serious since my sister died. Whoever was texting me these images were clearly not my mother, but also currently in my house. I turned my game console off and removed my headset. Once doing so, I could hear everything above me. It sounded as if an animal with nails or claws was walking on the main level hardwood floor. Sounds of things crashing and even screaming could be heard. I knew right away that something was wrong. However, the sounds of whatever was upstairs seemed to move around the house. At one point, I could have sworn that the sounds made their way down the stairs and even into my room. I called the police and told them that there was someone in my house. I tried my best to be as quiet as I could, but seeing how scared I was, I felt like whatever was in the basement with me was for sure going to hear me. I told them my address and that I feared for my parents' lives and to get here as soon as possible. The 10 or 15 minutes it took the place to get to my house felt like hours. When I knocked on my front door, I nearly jumped out of my skin. By this time, whatever was in my house had made its way back up the stairs. I could hear whosoever footsteps run in the opposite direction of the front door and out the back door, which led to the woods. I waited. I wanted to make sure that whatever ran out of my house was a good ways away before I tried to answer the door. After a few seconds, I slowly left my hidden room and made my way out of my room and through the basement. All the lights were off in the house, Whoever was just here didn't seem to need them. I ran to the door and opened it to see two sets of officers at the door. It just ran outside. The two other officers ran around back while the other two came inside. I showed them my phone with the text images and my parents' bedroom and told them that I feared for their safety. The officers that saw my phone looked terrified. Where's your parents' room? It's on the main level and on the left side of the house. I can show you, I said as I began to lead them to their room. Why don't you wait outside while we check this out? You might not like what we find, one of the police officers said starkly while pulling out his pistol. One of the policemen guided me outside and into his warm cruiser. I sat in the front passenger seat and waited. I waited for the officers to come out, but they never did. More emergency responders arrived at the house including the same paramedics from earlier. I was exhausted, but my adrenaline seemed to keep me awake. Finally, 
I saw the officers exit the home while guiding the paramedics who were carrying two separate body bags on stretchers. I got out of the cruiser and fell to the ground and cried. The paramedic from earlier recognized me and walked over and knelt down. I want you to know them. You aren't safe here. Whatever did that stuff to that lady in the car saw you. Not only that, but followed you home. I'm sorry about your parents. The paramedic stood up and walked over to his vehicle, while more police showed up at the scene. The Decade The thing about death that they don't tell you is the smell. When anything dies, it loses all control of bladder and bowel functions. What makes things worse is when the flesh of the deceased has been rotting for some time. The decade is a type of smell that you'll never forget. I remember one time when I was eight, I was with my uncle deer hunting, closing in on the twilight hours, and it was getting dark fast. It was the last day of the season, so I had to capitalize on the opportunity, or I'd have to wait until next season. Having sat in the stand all day, you could only imagine my surprise when a moderately sized buck ran out from the brush and poked its head out into a small clearing. I drew my bow back and held the arrow waiting for the deer to come out more, but it just stood outside my field of view. I loosed my arrow and sent it flying into the brush, hoping to make any contact. The shot wasn't clean since it hit a few branches and some brush, but surely the arrow had indeed hit its target as the deer acted accordingly. My uncle, despite being the expert tracker, was struggling to find any signs of the said deer when we went to look for it. The deer must have gone through some of the brush at a high speed, making the tracks more difficult the closer it came to night. We had an idea of where the deer had headed, but we weren't sure if the deer had even died yet. Around seven, when the sun had completely set, we had to call off the search since we lost all the tracks in the dark. The next day, we headed out into the woods, when the sun was clear overhead. We went to the last place where we'd seen the tracks, and sure enough, up in the sky were crows circling not far off overhead. That was a sure sign that something had died nearby. It took us about five minutes to find from there the remains of the deer. We smelt it before we saw it. The stench was unlike any spoiled meat I'd ever smelled. It was an invisible cloud of rancid death. By the time we got to the deer, there had been plenty of scavenging animals and various types of bugs already eating my prized animal. This deer was surely mine as it still had my arrow lodged in its side. Fast forward seven years. My father ran away during that time and my mother couldn't really cope with his absence, so she turned to drugs as an escape. This led me to eventually stay with my grandmother, who lived in the next county over, but still allowed me to stay in the same school based on a technicality and the school district lines. I was able to still be with my friends, and that's all I had to go off of for quite some time. My living situation wasn't exactly ideal. The grandmother that I was staying with had been declining with Alzheimer's for quite some time now. Even before my parents split, she was already forgetting my name and calling me by my father's name by mistake. My grandfather had died a while back, way before that I could remember. I was told, however, that I would have liked him if he was still around. My grandmother got to the point to where she would spout nonsense, almost about everything, and never slept throughout the night without screaming. Due to her condition, my grandmother had a full-time caretaker, who didn't speak any English, that came and lived with us and aided my grandmother. I would obviously help out whenever I could, but I was still a child. During this odd time of my life, there had been a string of murders in the adjacent towns nearby, but none in ours. Much like what you see on TV, I just took this as the media trying to fearmonger you into more views for their news station, so I didn't pay it much mind. However, the school district didn't see it that way, and was very strict on security. Most of my school's extracurricular activities had been canceled, which was unfortunate. However, in the meantime, I picked up Airsoft, which I was really getting into with a couple of friends. 
We would practice and hang out in the woods until it got fairly dark. I suppose playing airsoft in some way allowed me to escape the harsh reality that was currently my family state. I caught on the news that evening that a body was found dismembered in a field on the other side of the town. The head was missing and the body was skinned. That made for eight murders in the span of three months. The killings were getting closer. Later that night, I got a text from my dad stating that he wanted to meet up for lunch the next day. I hadn't talked to my dad in three years, so this caught me by surprise. I debated on ignoring him, but I ended up responding and agreeing to have him pick me up. I guess there was some news he wanted to tell me in person. That night, I hardly slept. I was anxious about the next day. I figured that he was going to ask me to move back in with them since my grandmother was no longer able to care for herself, let alone me. I fell asleep, but shortly after I was soon awakened by my grandmother screaming, as she normally did. Thankfully, the caretaker, who was always on the ball, seemed to be able to caress her back into sleep. Even though I knew the current state of my grandmother, her screams in the middle of the night always seemed to terrify me, at least at first. However, I found myself back asleep and I woke up the next day to my alarm clock. I got ready and waited for my dad to pick me up. He was early. The car he was in was a newer model, one I'd never seen him in before. I saw him pull up, but I made him walk up to the door and knock on it. I embraced him half-heartedly and we walked over to his car. We drove over to a restaurant across town without saying a word to each other and grabbed a booth in the back corner. My dad was never good with words, especially small talk. I knew he had something important to tell me, but I wasn't sure what it was. Did he want me to move back in with him? Was he moving somewhere? Did he find someone else to live with? We finally ordered our meals, and he smiled at me with eyes full of reluctance. He was clearly troubled by something, but was trying his best to put on a brave face. I just wanted to rip this band-aid off and asked him, what he wanted to tell me. He began to cry when he reached out for my hand, but I pulled away. What, what is it? I asked in a demanding tone. It's your mother. She was one of the victims of the recent murders last week. I just found out yesterday. This news hit me like several waves of emotion. At first I was confused. Then I was sad. Finally, I was angry. I didn't wait for my food to come to the table. I just got up and left right then and there. My father stayed behind and just sobbed at the table, like a child. I expected him to come after me and bring me back, but he never did. I made my way out of the restaurant and down the street. I was so upset I didn't realize where I was until it started to rain, but it didn't matter. I just needed to walk. A part of me wanted to go back to that table and ask about her death, but I was filled with hatred towards the person who had killed my mother, but also for some strange way, I also blamed my father. He and my mother should still be together. He should have protected her. After about an hour of walking, I realized I was on the other side of the town. I had no money for a taxi and I couldn't call my grandmother. I sure as heck wasn't going to call my father. I could use the walk anyways, I thought. I kept off to the sides of the road and on the border of the tree line, not thinking about anything as the swirling cocktail of emotions overflowed in my head. I finally made it to the part of the town that I could recognize. There was the old abandoned lumber mill that I would sometimes play airsoft at with my friends. We would only play outside in the lumber yard, never inside. The lumber mill had heavy chains and a lock on the exterior doors, preventing anyone from getting in. Probably to keep squatters out and from people hurting themselves on the bandsaw. I decided to walk through the lumber yard in order to take a shortcut and quickly get back home. The shortcut alongside my curiosity would soon become a mistake. As I was crossing the yard, a startling noise got my attention coming from inside the lumber mill, seemed to be screaming. I figured this to be unlikely, 
considering that all the doors and windows were not only securely fastened, but locked from the outside. I looked at the lumber mill, and sure enough, after a quick inspection of the exterior, one of the boards that covered the windows had fallen off, leaving about a four-foot hole to enter through. My body was reacting in a way that most prey do when they sense danger nearby. I had tingles going down the back of my neck, and a chill going down my spine, goosebumps on my arms. However, my mind, being preoccupied with the recent bad news, told me, just take a quick peek inside. I quickly walked over to the window and peered inside. Due to the angle of the window and the poor lighting, I saw next to nothing. However, the screaming got more intense. A part of me wanted to see what was going on and try to help while the rest of my body was telling me to get out of there. The next thing I knew, I was crawling inside the lumber mill. The smell of old wood and sawdust filled my nostrils. The screaming persisted as if someone were to be tortured. However, the sound seemed to be coming from below, as if it was in some type of basement. I looked around briefly for some stairs, but I couldn't really find any. After a quick search and following the sounds of the screams, I soon found a hole in the floor. The hole in the floor was no bigger than 18 inches. Although I was young and quite small, this was still something I wouldn't be able to fit into. The wooden floor that I walked on creaked as I walked over to the hole. I took my smartphone out of my pocket and turned on the flashlight feature and peered inside. Inside the hole seemed to be some kind of basement area. The area was filled with old tools and some scraps and pieces of metal that I didn't really know what they were. In the corner of the basement, I saw movement coming from a figure. It took me a second to realize what I was looking at, since I've never seen anything like this before. The figure was tall and quite skinny. It didn't appear that they were wearing any clothing. The angle and the perspective at which I was at did not do me any favors. However, what I was looking at, I knew wasn't normal. It was what I saw next that made my blood run cold. As the screaming continued, I realized that the screams were not coming from this figure, but from another one. Laying on the ground, under one of the knees of the tall, gaunt figure, was a man. The man was curled up in the fetal position, not trying to move. At first, I thought the tall creature was pulling clothes off the man. But, after a few seconds of watching, I soon realized it wasn't pulling off clothes. It was pulling off chunks of skin. This was single-handedly the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen in my life. At this time, my mind and body finally agreed that it was now time to get out of there. Unfortunate to say, my escape was less than stealthy. I had just seen the most terrifying thing I have ever seen in my life, so the first thing I did was sprint out of there. My adrenaline seemed to have carried me out of there quite quickly. I ran out of the building, through the lumber yard, and a good portion down the street. By the time I got home, it was nighttime. My grandmother didn't say anything when I walked in. The caretaker just waved as she was still feeding my grandmother some soup. A part of me wished that she'd asked me where I'd been all day, so I would have an excuse to tell her what I'd seen, but obviously that didn't happen. The caretaker didn't speak English, so even if I did tell her what I'd seen, she would have not have understood me. I just walked past and into my room. So much had happened today, I wasn't sure how to cope with it. Being told about the death of my mother, some creature skinning some poor person alive, it was all too much for my young brain. That evening is when the dreams started. They were horrifying. I didn't want to relive that event seeing that poor person being killed in the most horrifying way possible. But it appeared that my mind had other plans. In my dream, I was back in that lumber mill. I was peering in that hole seeing that creature and that poor person. However, off to the right, I saw a door being opened, slowly. There was no one or no thing opening the door. It just opened on its own. I shined my flashlight over to see a set of stairs heading downwards. Like in most dreams, dream logic prevailed. I didn't want to go down the set of stairs. However, I was being guided 
by some unseen force. I slowly descended the set of stairs, each step sending my anxiety and my stress up to a higher level. I finally made it to the bottom of the stairs. Fear had a new grip on me which I'd never felt before. I felt like my life was going to soon come to an end. A brief shine of my flashlight in the basement revealed the horrifying image before me. Much like what I was seeing from above, I saw the creature skinning the man alive. Except now this time, I was a part of it. Shining my flashlight revealed my position, causing the creature to stop what it was doing. In a flash of horrifying speed, the creature quickly pounced on me. The creature pinned me down effortlessly, while taking a long and withered hand across my torso, while grabbing onto my skin and tearing it from my body. The pain, despite still being in a dream, was unbearable. It felt like flaming screws were being dragged across my body. Before I awoke, something interesting happened. The creature took a handful of my skin and placed it onto its own dried and withered body. When it did this, a part of its body changed into mine, and it smiled. I then awoke from this dream, and I was back in my bed. I let out a sigh of relief, seeing that I was back in my own room. However, it would appear that the nightmare was not quite over. I tried to move to get up to go to the bathroom, but I was paralyzed. Panic and anxiety soon quickly ensued. To make matters worse, I could see out of the corner of my eye a tall, shadowy figure standing in my bedroom. The figure got closer to me. It practically stood right over my bed. Thankfully, it didn't take long for me to fall back asleep. Although I didn't notice this at the time, but the shadow figure from my sleep paralysis and the creature in my dream had similar characteristics. It was as if it followed me from that horrific dream. I awoke the next day, and it took me some time before I remembered what had happened the night before. Thankfully, I planned on playing airsoft with my friends. This is something normally I could manage to do all day. My friend group was small, but we had a close bond despite having such different lives. Later that day, we met in the forest, and us four played for hours. We only stopped twice once to go get some food at a friend's house whose mother was kind enough to provide a luxurious spread of pizza and soda. The other time we stopped so we could take a bathroom break. We found an area so secluded in the woods that we didn't have to worry about being quiet or for someone to accidentally catch a glimpse of us using the restroom, which is bound to happen when you have unsupervised group of boys out in the woods for so long. The times I spent out in the woods shooting and being shot at by my friends with airsoft guns made me forget about the world. I was mentally in a place that life was almost enjoyable, at least for the time being. This would change when I would go home. It was now dark out. I had successfully spent my Saturday almost completely outside in the woods. The location we played in would cause me to take a path that would lead to the back of my house that faced another set of woods. I was tired and sweaty, so seeing the back door being left open caused no initial reason for alarm. It was probably my grandmother's caretaker having a smoke break and leaving the door open to hear if my grandmother needed anything. What did surprise me was that the house had hardly any lights on. I walked into the kitchen and turned on the lights. I could hear shuffling in the other room and assumed it was my grandmother. I peeked my head in the other room and was shocked to see my grandmother standing and facing the corner. She stood slouched and slightly trembling. I immediately ran over and grabbed her wheelchair and sat her down safely. Where's Lucinda? I asked, knowing full well she wasn't going to respond correctly. She looked at me with a glance of fright, but she often looked as if she didn't know what was going on. I made sure to stay with Grandma until Lucinda returned, but she never did. After waiting for two hours, I took it upon myself to get Grandma ready for the evening and tuck her in. I forgot how difficult it was to get her ready since she was so non-compliant. After getting her into bed, I took a quick shower and did the same. I laid in bed waiting for sleep to fill my eyes, letting my mind wander the dark plains that dreams are found on when I heard a sound. 
Initially, the sound scared me. Underneath my bed came the sound of something banging and scratching. At first, I thought perhaps it was one of my cats, but I was too afraid to look. My curiosity outweighed my fear, and I glanced under my bed to see nothing there. The banging continued, only for a few more minutes. Perhaps the house was settling, or some kind of animal crawled under the floorboards and got stuck. Sleep eventually found me, but I wish it hadn't. My dreams were filled with terror and pain. I could see the anguish of people being dragged into the woods where dreadful things would happen. The dream was from the perspective that I was hurting these people, but I was not in human form. I took the shape of some evil beast with long arms and painfully sharp fingers, much like the one I saw the night before. My dream was in first person, but I could only tell from the look on the people's face that I must have been this terrifying beast. Again, I woke up in a cold sweat. Thankfully, I was not paralyzed this time. It was still nighttime, and I was still tired. It took me a second to realize what caused me to wake as I rubbed my eyes and got out of bed. I could hear someone in my house screaming. They were the screams of my grandmother. Normally, my grandmother had her nurse to help her fall back asleep, but seeing how that she was now gone, I figured that I had to help her. I opened my door, and the screaming immediately stopped. It was as if making sounds alerted her, and she became quiet. I waited in the doorway, seeing if the screams would continue. I wanted to check up on her regardless, just to make sure. I walked down the hall, and as I passed the kitchen, I could see the back door to the house was open. I paused, as a chill slowly crept down my spine, as the thought of someone else being inside the house slowly festered, like an old wound. The door being open didn't initially indicate to me anything other than a potential intruder. That is, until I went over to close the door, and I glanced outside. Outside, just beyond the veil of light that was emitted from the kitchen, was a figure. I instantly recognized it as my grandmother. She was still in the field of view, but was facing the woods. She was shaking like she normally did, but her gown was wet. She must have been freezing. I ran outside to grab her when I heard something that made me stop in my tracks. Inside, I could hear the familiar scream of my grandmother the one I thought who was in front of me. I was about 20 yards away from whoever this person was that was imitating my grandmother. I slowly backpedaled while not taking my eyes off this person in fear that they would attack me. I tripped going into the kitchen and ran quickly inside, locking the door behind me. I went to check my grandmother, who I found was on the floor. She was sobbing, but I was able to get her back up and onto the bed. For my sanity's sake, I decided to share the bed with my grandmother that night in her room. I made sure to lock the door, but also moved a small piece of furniture in front of the door as a safety precaution. I didn't sleep much that night, mainly from my grandmother tossing and turning, but I would be lying to say that my encounter with whatever it was outside didn't shake me up. The next morning, I did my best to get my grandmother ready. This took some time since I had to dress her and feed her on my own. I called the nursing company and told them about the situation, how the nurse just got up and left my grandmother without warning. They were also surprised since she didn't mention anything to them either. The morning and the rest of the afternoon, I waited for the replacement nurse to come and help my grandmother. There were a few things I wanted to do that day, but those things would have to wait until I knew my grandmother was safe. Around three, the replacement nurse finally showed up, and I texted all my friends to quickly get a game of airsoft going before the night came. In between matches, I shared with them what had happened the night before. Seeing what had happened out loud made me realize that it was really late last night. It was pretty poor visibility, and I was probably still very tired. That back door always had an issue being locked. It was quite possible that it just didn't close all the way. After mulling it over with my friends, I felt much better. I think with everything going around lately, it just put me in a weird mindset and on high alert. 
We made sure to end before dark, since none of us wanted to be outside in the dark woods with a potential serial killer on the loose. I walked back to my house and entered my backyard. I glanced over to the part of the base of the house and saw a door to the crawl space. It was slightly ajar. I then remembered what had happened the night before about the pounding and scratching. Something was probably under there. Having my airsoft gun, I felt a false sense of security. I'm sure I could clear out the crawl space with a few well-placed shots of whatever critter was down there. I turned the flashlight on my gun and opened the crawl space door. A quick peek inside revealed something in the back corner that happened to be under my room. I shot a few shots at the mass, which caused it to move slightly, but still sat in the same position. It was so far back in there that I couldn't make out what it was that was under there. I got on my hands and knees and went inside and crawled under the house. The smell of death instantly struck me, and I found it hard to breathe. I could hear an odd sound now coming from the red mass as it began to bang on the floor above, causing the same noise that I'd heard the night before. The movements looked human, but my eyes refused to believe that this weird pile in my back corner had any life to it. I continued crawling, but made sure to keep my gun pointed at it. The smell alone was nauseating, causing me to lose the ability to think about anything other than that smell. When I finally crawled within distance, I realized why it took me so long to identify what was making that sound. What was under my floor was the nurse who had gone missing. She was still alive, but barely. To my horror, the state in which she was left in caused me to scream. All of her skin had been removed, which left a writhing vessel of flesh that was barely clinging to life. She couldn't say anything. She just moaned. I tried to flee from the terrible scene and turned around by crawling. The nurse who was now behind me was crying, while another sound could be heard over by the door of the crawl space. It was a shuffling sound, but the speed at which it moved was very quick. I could see it looked like an elongated person crawling much like a spider. Flesh could be seen falling off of its body as it moved over to the door of the crawl space. Of all the terrible things this creature could have done, it performed a simple task in which I knew I was going to die. My airsoft pellets were not going to save me from the horrors that this creature was going to do to me. Instead of crawling out of the crawl space, the creature quickly but simply closed the crawl space door, trapping me inside with it. My name is Brenna and I work as a paleontologist, which is someone who finds and restores fossils for a living. I really enjoy my job because it allows me to work with limited human interaction and because I genuinely enjoy finding new fossils. It's like working on an extremely hard puzzle in which you have to find the pieces. I always get a sense of accomplishment when I either put together an incredibly difficult creature or on the rare occasion when I find a new species. We were called to southern Utah in a remote section of national parks where rock formations and caves are prevalent. This place alone is home to so many unique dinosaur finds which often surprise people. When we go to locations like Utah, I bring a small team with me which is about three people, including myself, and we stay on site. Thankfully, my team consists of another girl named Katie, who's around my age, and an older gentleman that we call Papa John, who is in his early 60s. Papa John had been doing this gig longer than me and Katie had been alive. He was super cool to work with and was also a complete stoner, which makes our camping trips all the more enjoyable. When we would take the crib, we'd bring a camper with us and usually just stay in there together. Thankfully, Papa John isn't a creep, but rather a grandfather-like figure which makes sharing the same space for a few weeks bearable. Katie is like most girls where I'm not. I've been told that I give off a punk vibe, but I don't quite see it. It's probably because of my tattoos. Anyways, back to the story. We had been working on the side of this mountain one day, getting samples for a possible site to find more fossils when Papa John goes for one of his walks, aka his smoke break. 
when I say smoke, I don't necessarily mean a cigarette. Instead of old John coming back with blazed eyes and a slight stagger in his step, he comes back, out of breath and with excitement. Katie and I shoot her heads up to see he's holding something. It appears to be a small rock that had been cracked down the middle, encasing the remains of a fossil. Apparently his smoke break actually yielded results to our dig site, and he happened to stumble across a cool find. It wasn't the rock that excited him though, more so where he found the rock. He told us to follow him, which we did confusingly. He took us down this beaten path that lined the base of the mountain. The right side of the path had been overgrown with brush and sage, which made going down the path a bit of a squeeze. John was always good about finding good places to smoke so he wouldn't get caught. This was definitely the place to do it. As we continued to press through the intense brush, we eventually arrived at John's prized location at the base of the mountain. There was a large boulder that appeared to be covering what looked like an entrance to a cave. John was convinced that this cave was sure to have priceless fossils hidden inside. The only problem was that we needed to find a way to move this boulder. John, being old in age and not having any equipment with them, was not able to move the boulder, but he figured that me and Katie with a few pickaxes would be able to chip away the boulder enough for one of us to slip inside. Looking at the truck-sized boulder, this would take us some time. I went back to the RV and grabbed two pickaxes and a shovel, while Katie and John stayed back. We started working on the boulder, but we were only able to work for an hour or two before the sun got too low. We figured that it would be okay to leave our tools here since the area was completely hidden. We were the only ones in the area anyways. We went back to the RV and had our typical evening of having a small dinner and playing cards. John smiled the entire night, ear to ear with excitement. He kept telling us the best finds of his career have always been in areas of shelter, much like a cave. Southern Utah was a hotspot for things like this. The night continued on with high energy and anticipation for what was to come of the cave. There was a good chance that we'd be able to find valuable minerals in there as well, depending on the age of the cave. John woke us up early the next morning with coffee and singing. He was ready to get the day started despite it still being dark outside. Nonetheless, this didn't stop the jolly man from handing us headlamps and skipping down to the cave. Katie and I were not morning people. However, it was hard to stay mad at John for long. We made it back to the entrance of the cave where nothing seemed out of place. Our tools still remained in the same place as well as the menacing boulder that prevented our entry. Katie and I worked at chipping at the sides of the boulder while John dug at its base. The chipping seemed nearly pointless since the progress was so minimal. I was certain that the right people with the right equipment would be able to move this in mere seconds, but time nor money happened to be on our side. About halfway through the day, John was able to dig enough at the base of the boulder to make it shift about a foot. This was just enough to open a small hole near the bottom where the boulder met the cave. Although being a small opening, it was just enough to send one person in without any gear. John was too big and I had claustrophobia, so I definitely wasn't going into the entrance until the hole was bigger. This left it to Katie, who was always up for a challenge. She took off her gear and got on her hands and knees and tried wiggling her way in. She kept her headlamp on from earlier this morning and peered inside. She told us how large the cave was and that we definitely all needed to come in and explore it. We handed her her gear and told her that we'll keep working on the boulder without her while she explored. We told her to be careful and not to get lost. Caves were notorious for people going missing. We worked more on the boulder, which took us some more time. Another hour or two, and we managed to produce another four inches on both sides of the hole. This still wasn't enough for John to fit in, and I still wasn't comfortable trying to squeeze in with this size. We called into the hole for Katie to give us a quick update, but she didn't answer. We figured she was too far into the cave for her to hear us, and we just kept working. We worked a little bit more before John and I decided to take a quick smoke break. I really wasn't one for smoking, but I was tired, and I still needed a break. We just sat off the side of the boulder, and John and I lit a smoke. I drank a Powerade that had been in my bag while downing a cliff bar that had since melted from this morning. I was catching a bit of secondhand smoke from John's weed, and I felt a little lightheaded. 
John and I were talking about music and other random things when we heard a muffled scream coming from inside the cave. We looked at each other, rather confused, and snapped out of our trance we had. John and I both ran over to the hole and peered inside while shining a flashlight. Katie, are you okay? John's genuinely concerned. However, we got no response, which was rather concerning. John looked to me with shock on his face. We need to open this cave right now, he said. A chill went down my spine when I said I'd go in just to check on her. John looked even more surprised. Bruna, are you sure? You don't have to do this. I know you have claustrophobia. We can work on the boulder some more so you don't feel so claustrophobic. I sized a slightly bigger hole up in my mind and I figured it was doable. Frankly, this was a lie. I took off my bag and put on my headlamp. The lamp wasn't very bright, but it was better than nothing. I started going in head first and I worked my way in. The cave immediately opened up once I got a few feet inside, which was reassuring. However, I felt pressure on all sides of my body while pushing through. This triggered my phobia and I began to slightly panic. I pushed through more hastily and finally made it in without having a full panic attack. I felt proud of myself. I was able to overcome one of my greatest fears that I had in a very much needed situation. I snapped out of my self-congratulations and began my search for Katie. The cave was tall and was somewhat wide, but completely dark save for the small hole of light I just entered from. The hole was able to illuminate about 20 feet or so, but anything beyond that was completely dark. I was able to notice that on the ground were footprints. Footprints who would have had to have been Katie's. This should make finding Katie rather easy for me since the cave had yet to split in other directions, which caves were known to do. I made sure not to wander too far, yet I kept a watchful eye out for Katie. I called out her name rather loudly, since I had no need to be quiet. I was trying to find someone, so this was the best course of action. My cell phone obviously was not able to work, since we were in the cave and it had poor reception. I kept following the footprints, which went deeper into the cave. The cave not only went into the mountain, but also on a downward slope. The cave's floor went from dirt to mud, and now to stone, which made tracking Katie's prints nearly impossible. I couldn't help but notice the temperature getting slightly more and more cold. This was fine, although I wasn't dressed for anything below 70 degrees. I also noticed that my senses were on high alert. I attributed this to my adrenaline pumping from my claustrophobic encounter from earlier. My hair stood on the back of my neck, and I now felt scared. I was deciding if the search would have to wait for John to open the cave more, and he could come inside, and that's when I heard it. That's when I heard a scream. Not Katie's scream, to be exact, but rather, something else. It didn't sound like Katie at all. It sounded like some type of large, predatory animal. I froze in my place, but I then realized that the cave system often had air circulate throughout them creating strange sounds. I only knew this because I'd worked on an excavation that was once in a cave. The sounds can be terrifying, much like the one I just heard, but when you realize that when air is flowing through jagged rocks, much like the ones that were lining this wall, it makes sense. Essentially, it made the cave a giant death whistle. I was tempted to call out again to Katie, but the gust of wind that resembled a scream had caused me to no longer be as brave. I turned back to check up on John to see what progress he had made, and also to alleviate some nerves that I had recently acquired. Thankfully, I hadn't made it too deep into the cave, so the walk back only took a few minutes. When walking back, I could see the light coming from the hole and movement from outside. Before I was within talking distance, I heard a rock fall deep from within the cave, roughly where I was just standing. Could this be Katie? I stopped in my tracks and looked both ways back to the entrance and then again to the sound that came from within the darkness. I decided to check in with John to let him know that I was okay and that I thought I heard Katie. I went over to the hole and I noticed that it was much smaller now. My heart sank. There was no way I was going to be able to get through this hole. John, what happened to the hole? I screamed. Sorry, Brenna, he shouted. When I was digging the boulder, it readjusted due to the soft soil. However, I heard Katie on the other side of the boulder. Brenna, I found a way out of there, she exclaimed. You just need to go deeper in and take a left at the large stalactite. From there, you'll be able to hike up and out near the camper. But be careful. 
I think there's something living inside. My fear became paralyzing. I know that Katie was just trying to help, but that information absolutely terrified me. I just considered waiting by the entrance until they were able to shift the boulder again, but that could take hours. Plus, I could tell that it was getting dark outside since the light that was coming in was much more dim. My thoughts raced about the gust of wind and the rock that fell from earlier. Hopefully, that was the cause for the rock to fall and not some large animal that was going to eat me. I hiked a good ways into the cave, but I'd yet to see any mineral formations that even resembled a stalactite. Thankfully, my LED headlamp had fresh batteries from this morning, so I could count on those for a few good hours of light before my light gave out. I walked further in and heard a wind of gust much louder this time. However, it didn't sound like the one from before. This time, it had a whistle to it and actually felt the gust of wind. This was both good and bad since whatever I heard earlier might not have been a wind gust. However, this did mean that I was near a cave entrance. I pressed on further into the cave, doing my best to stay calm and to find the underground landmark to guide me to the exit. But the further I went, the more I felt despair and hopelessness. I'm not exactly sure if this had anything to do with the cave itself or the looming idea of there being something malicious hiding in its depths. I did my best to try to stay silent so I could try to hear more wind gusts, but also to try to stay concealed in the darkness that surrounded me. Up ahead, I heard something. This time, it wasn't a gust of wind or a scream from some kind of animal, but rather shuffling as if something was walking on all fours and they were crawling throughout the cave, not knowing what to do since I had no way to defend myself nor anywhere to really run. I did the only thing I could do in my state of panic, which was to turn off my light. This was a huge risk since most of, if not all animals that inhabit caves have the ability to see in the dark. If this was the case, then turning off my light would only put me at a disadvantage. I had to act fast since whatever was coming at me seemed to be coming quickly. There was a good chance that whatever it was had already seen my light, but I had to try. I turned off my light and held my breath. The shuffling continued up until where I was standing, and it stopped. My heart sank and my blood froze. Something knows that I'm here. Instead of shuffling, I then heard the sound of sniffing coming from a small distance away. It was as if whatever it was knew I was there, but couldn't quite pinpoint exactly. I leaned up against the wall of the cave and ran my hands along the wall, hoping for something to try to climb up onto. I grabbed what felt like a solid hold that could elevate me up a few feet, and I silently started climbing. My feet felt around for any type of support to try to help lift me, but I felt nothing. I then pushed on the wall of the cave with both my feet and pulled myself up using non-existent upper body strength. The hold I was grasping with my shaky hands started to crack and completely disconnected from the wall. I then fell only a few feet, but it was enough to get the attention of whatever was sniffing. By whatever unfortunate circumstances that caused the rock to disconnect from the wall, fate now seemed to somehow be in my favor, as I was now holding a large rock in my hand. Before I could even register the pain from falling for those few feet, I was then grabbed by the creature. To my surprise, I was not met with sharp teeth, but rather, rough textured hands. Something grabbed my legs and let out a scream that resembled the sound I had heard earlier in the cave. My instincts kicked in and I swung the rock that I was holding in the direction of the scream, and instantly connected with soft tissue. But I also heard a cracking sound upon connection, then sobbing sounds. I was confused as I was under the impression I was being attacked by some kind of animal, but it was now crying. Did I just hit someone in the face with a large rock? My adrenaline was at an all-time high and I was very confused. I turned on my headlight not thinking about the situation, and I instantly regretted it. My light shined on what looked like a woman, but her hair was ragged and it covered her face. The woman was wearing pelts of fur from other animals which looked like they were rotting. The woman was clutching her face that was spewing dark red blood profusely. The woman was crouched down, which made her seem normal size, but when I tried to speak to her and apologize, she glanced over at me through her matted hair and stood up. The woman was grotesquely tall. I was more confused than anything by this. 
Her arms were long and connected to ungodly looking hands. Her hands had long brown fingernails that resembled claws. The woman was no longer sobbing and she removed her hand from her face, revealing that I had indeed smashed her in the mouth with a rock. Her sobbing turned into rage as she revealed her teeth that were now reddened and broken. My first hit with the rock was a miracle since I'm very uncoordinated. I tried to throw the rock at the woman but I was nowhere near hitting her. I turned and immediately ran. I could hear the woman behind me drop to all fours and begin pursuing me. The adrenaline was able to give me a quick boost of stamina, but it didn't last long. I heard the screams coming from behind me, but to my surprise, I also heard distant screams ahead of me. It was as if she was alerting others. As I ran, I then entered what appeared to be a large opening in the cave. To my horror, it revealed a horrific sight of more creatures like the woman. However, they seemed to be eating something and were rather distracted by my entrance. I could see that what they were eating due to the colors of the clothes of the person were bright and recognizable. They were eating Katie. Thankfully, the creatures were preoccupied with their current meal that they seemed to not care that I was in their place. I continued past the small group and pressed on into the cave looking for anything that could get me out of here. The woman, however, continued her pursuit despite being a good distance away. The woman, or should I say creature, was starting to make ground as I began to tire from fatigue. All seemed lost as I didn't really have anywhere to go. There was a good chance that this cave didn't even have another entrance. However, my light then caught a flash of a stalactite that hung right before the entrance of two caves. I remember Katie's instructions to take the cave to the left, which I did. The cave took a sharp left. Thankfully, the advice from Katie seemed to prove useful as I saw that the cave veered up and to the left. The incline was steep and the ground was wet from moisture. A light current of water came in slowly trickling in on jagged rocks, making my footing very slippery. I was then forced to go on my hands and knees to scale my way up without slipping. The wet rocks also seemed to slow the creature behind me enough to ascend without being attacked. I finally reached the top of the cave and to my delight, it led to another small opening that led outside. Thankfully, it wasn't small enough to trigger my claustrophobia, but I did have to duck to get through. I went outside and saw that the exit was on the side of the mountain that seemed extremely out of the way. It was now nighttime and it was raining. I was able to quickly look around and see her camper a good distance away, and the lights were on. I wasn't sure if the creature was still behind me, but I didn't take any chances. I shuffled down quickly the steep mountain and sometimes having to slide down on my bum, which tore up my pants but I didn't care at this point. I could now feel the pain of all the scratches and bruises my horrific pursuit had incurred. My hands were cut and my legs ached from the small fall and from all the running. I reached the trailer and fell down while banging on the trailer door. I was met by Papa John and by Katie. I was out of breath and I couldn't say anything for a few seconds. I pointed at Katie in confusion and I tried to explain what I saw in the cave. They were eating her. Katie and John both looked at each other and grinned at me with a wide smile revealing long sharp teeth. Both then started to convulse and shake wildly shifting into those creatures from inside the cave. They both grabbed me and rather than kill me right then and there, they began to drag me back into the cave.